through the Development Committee. I'm Councillor Fillmore, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we start. Um, first of all, just to highlight that today's meeting is a hybrid meeting in that uh, the committee members are present at the canal side meeting room today. Uh, we will they'll be taking part through the, the team's meeting. We have a, a camera obviously in the room and a microphone. We will be hopefully hold on with slight technical issue. Okay. So the members will be taking part actually in the room, but we are joined from outside the room virtually by uh, officers who will be presenting, uh, members of the public, and those who wish to view the proceedings of today's meeting. I would just highlight that only councillors who are present in the room are able to vote on the applications before us. Uh, could I ask all members uh, that they make sure that they've got their mobiles turned off or set to silent? And just to highlight that this meeting is being recorded. A couple of housekeeping notes for the room itself. Um, there's no planned fire drill, so if alarms go, then, then you do need to leave the room. The safety exits are at the back of the room and to the sides. Uh, toilet facilities are located at the back of the room. Uh, there is water available outside. And uh, if we then move on, that um, the format of the meeting will be as per the agenda that's been published. A copy of the officer presentations can be found on the committee web pages. We'll take each application in turn. The officers will outline the application, followed by uh, the public speaking time. Uh, for those present, I would ask if you, uh, as I say, you don't need to worry about controlling your microphones or your cameras. That will all be done through the centre of the meeting. Uh, only members of the public who are registered to speak can address the meeting, and then members will obviously debate and decide on the applications before us. Just to uh, introduce for those who are online who's, who's with us today, uh, within the room itself, on my left and right, I've got the, uh, the councillors who will be debating and deciding the applications. On the top table to my right uh, are our democratic services are represented. And on my left, the planning officers are represented as I say, others will be joining us virtually. Uh, our legal team is with us online today, so uh, we, are, we are covered with the normal officer uh, and member present, members who will be present during the meeting. If we move then, I think probably best to the agenda itself. Uh, the first item is apologies for absence. Do we have any today, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, we received uh, apology from Councillor Haywood. He's our new member, but he's not undergone his uh, mandatory training as yet. Thank you. Can I welcome Councillor Hayward to the meeting virtually today and look forward to meeting you to the, the, the full committee once you've had your, your planning training. Item two is urgent business. I've not been advised that there's any urgent business that isn't on our agenda. Uh, item three is public speaking time. Uh, for members of the public who registered to speak, uh, we'll have, as I say, the, the officers will present the application before us. Once they've done that, we'll invite you to the, uh, the speaker's table to address the committee. You have three minutes to do that. Uh, you will see there's a, a timer at the front of the room, and we will uh, obviously ask you to draw your comments to a close before that uh, three minutes runs out. Item four is declarations of interest. Uh, are there any declarations? I'll start with, a, if I can do a general declaration for the members. Uh, we've been advised that any of us who are members of the uh, drainage board committees uh, need to declare a non-predetermination declaration that we've taken no part in discussions on the recommendations that have come from the drainage boards. Uh, that's an officer recommendation, but we need to make sure that's recorded that, uh, that, that we're not involved in that decision-making process so that we can make decisions today. Councillor Pearce. Um, yes, I declare a personal interest on both our applications on pages 6 and 27 for this morning session. As a member of Bridgewater Town Council, I've not taken part in any discussions, and I am a member of the Power Change Board for where that's appropriate. Thank you. Yes, Chairman, thank you. Yes, the same two, one of the Town Rue and one of Homburg Way, the member of Bridgewater Town Council, just a personal interest. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Well, Mr. Chairman, thanks for taking three things. I uh, certainly have to be really for the director to make part of any conversation regarding the final household. Uh, item number, sorry, page number 14, uh, Oxford Street, where I'm just a very good comment from my past. Uh, 
Britain or the United Kingdom to commit about in any conversation. Uh, item number 29, I will turn and see if we can replace the Don Newman with uh, the DPI in the interest of the Thank you. Okay. Can I just, again, for, for those who are online, I don't know if I could look towards Don Newman or, or Mr. Howlett. Um, can you actually hear clearly what members are, are saying with the microphones that we, we've got here? Chairman, I am having difficulty hearing. Sorry, Ms. Lehman, could you say? I, I am having difficulty hearing. Okay, if I could just ask members if, if you could make sure you speak up and project towards the microphone that's in the centre of the room and we'll, uh, we'll see how that works. Again, if I could ask, uh, say, Mr. Lehman and Mr. Howard, if, if you are having difficulties hearing, obviously others online will have been the same difficulties. If you could just indicate, uh, wave at me, and I will try and make sure that we uh, we speak up because obviously we can hear in the room. We just need to make sure that uh, those outside can hear it equally as clearly. Councillor Scott, I think. Yes. Yes. Um, um, I'm a member of the Expo Drainage Board, and I wish I'd taken no part in any planning discussion. Okay. Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, page 14, Chairman. That's in the Crown of Borough Library. I'm a member of that council, Chairman, I do not attend the planning committee meetings. And I would like some guidance, please, Chairman, on page 20. Just as a personal friend of the Ultimately, it, it will come down to Councillor Facey. If, if you, obviously, we all know the applicant as a, as a councillor. Um, it's if you are a close personal friend, for example, as, as you know, if, if you go out for meals, if you do those sort of things that close friends do, then you would need to declare no, interest. In that case, we're not close friends. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an association. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes, and then exactly. Uh, coming down the other side of the table, we have Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yes, I must declare that I am a member of the Greenwich Board, and I have taken no part in any discussions about anything to do with you. I'm also uh, in the same predicament. Page 14 um, uh, regarding Walter Street Run on Sea Island, uh, run on the Irish Town Councillor. And I'm also waiting for an invitation from uh, Councillor. <laughs> I'm also someone who obviously knows the applicant, but I'm not a, a close personal friend, so I just like to be clear that. No problem. I'm not, even, I'm not a member of the planning committee either, at any point. Okay, I would just, just to confirm 14 has been. The, the application on page 14 has actually been withdrawn from our agenda. The reason being that the uh, the objections that were received from the town council and from the ward member have been withdrawn and therefore it's being dealt with as a delegated matter. Uh, so they, that, that is no longer an issue that we come before us today. Okay. Again, coming down that slide, Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, as a member of the uh, Park Trade Board. Thank you. And yes, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. I'm also a member of the Pirate Drainage Board, so I've took the discussion. Thank you. And I'm a member of the Act Brew Drainage Board and uh, I've taken no part in their discussions. Okay, I think that, I'm not seeing any other declarations, so that brings us to the end of, of the declarations of interest. So if we move on to the planning applications, the first one that we have before us today is the application on page 27 where we have a, a speaker who is uh, present so if members can turn in their papers to page 27 this is the application in in Wemden and it's Mrs Debris I think you're presenting this one please Everyone in the room and remotely can now see the screen. Right, the um, application for members today is formation of an attenuation pond um, at Lansing North Pond Road Way in Bridgewater. 
Um, the application is being presented to members due to an objection from the parish council regarding the lack of explanation regarding the change from the drainage strategy um, relative to the consented um, scheme that was approved through the discharge of condition. Concerns regarding management and maintenance and ecological impact. Councillor Dudridge also objected to the application of duty location in flood zone 3. Um, the location of the site being outside the settlement boundary and the precedent that this may have on future development of this land parcel. Concern was also raised regarding potential impact on wildlife and ecology and the retrospective nature of the application and potential impact on the adjoining properties. So the main considerations in this case are principle of development, size scale and design, impact on adjoining properties, highway considerations, impact on ecology, drainage and flood risk. So the application site is located outside of the settlement boundary, adjoining Naples View and to the west of the residential site um, that this feature will be serving. Whilst the development is located outside the settlement boundary, the proposal is in connection with an existing development that's inside the settlement boundary and in principle would not appear out of keeping within an open green blue space such as this. The development that this application would serve is indicated on this slide with an orange star towards the bottom of the slide um, and adjoins the A39 to the east, Wendon Green to the south and Sabino Way to the north. There are land drains to the north and north northwest of the residential development which link this location. Oh, that's um, important. Is anyone else just seeing the main considerations mm -hmm. page? Yeah. Yeah, we're not seeing the map at the moment. I've just got no, main consideration. What? what? Oh, it's now gone to the map. No. Yeah, you haven't, but it has now. Okay. No, I haven't. I think there might be problems with direct access because we're having problems with people getting into the meeting. Okay. Just so you are aware. I will start this slide again. If you could. And I will as, go slowly. Just to confirm, has, has everyone now got a view of, of the overhead map? No. Yeah. No. No, yeah. this still hasn't, so. No, I just got to. It, it is up on the big screen for anyone in the room. Again, if I could just ask those who are outside the room, Ms. Mrs. Lehman, are you able to see the, the aerial photographs? Yes, um, Chairman, I do have a view of the aerial photograph. Okay, if we carry on then, if uh, if at any point, Mrs. Lehman, if 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 items are being referred to on the screen that you're not seeing, could you please let us know? Because uh, there obviously is some, some technical issues at the moment. But members who are in the room, if you can make your best effort, either see it on your own computer or also <coughs> on, the, on the big screen behind me, then uh, hopefully we can, uh, can carry on. I'm okay now. Yeah, there's, there's a delay on some yeah. machines. Okay. Thank you. This is the, I'm sorry, Mr. Gibbs, if you want to carry on. Um, so the development that this application would serve um, is shown on this slide by the orange star. It joins the A39 to the east, London Green to the south, and Sabino Way to the north. There are land drains to the north and northwest of this residential development, which link this location to the application site, um, and effectively seeks to relocate water attenuation, indicated by the red arrow on, um, on the above slide, to the west of the properties in Naples View, which is on agricultural land. Condition 15 on the original consent, which is 51, 12, 14, required a submission of surface water details um, to be submitted and discharged. And concern has been raised that um, through this application, there is insufficient information to confirm why they um, why they proposed this alternative site. This slide shows the details of the attenuation um, that was submitted and was discharged under the 2012 consent. So this layout um, adequately drained the site, although it resulted in the removal of gardens of one of the plots and limited the garden areas for others. So the developer is sought to agree an alternative arrangement. So just to explain this slide to members, this blue triangle on the top hand corner, that, that's an attenuation basin, so that would have been a really big pond. Um, and then this is an attenuation ditch, so that would have been dug out just to remain as a ditch for the lifetime of the development. Dawn, so, can I just pause you again? I'm sorry about this. But is anyone else getting the arrow showing up on their screen or not? Okay. 
Yes. 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 I remember seeing that on their screens. Yes. 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 Okay, because I'm okay, I'm not, but as long as others are seeing that's that's fine. Yeah. I can I can look at workshop, that's fine. Okay. There's a sort of red mark. So where the red mark is, the attenuation basin, the triangular uh, pond, and the green an attenuation ditch, so a big ditch dug out at the bottom of the gardens. So as members can see, the first plot here would have had sort of nearly no garden. Um, plot two and plot four would have been impacted by the drainage arrangement. So just to provide further clarity again, this slide just shows the location of the attenuation basin relative to the Salerno Court development. So the Salerno Court development um, as we've shown, this development down here with the houses that have gone in and the attenuation pond um, basin as a result of this application is this top hand um, hatched area in this location. So, this area of land has previously been subject to planning applications um, for a nursery which was refused and dismissed to planning commission due to the constraints of the access to serve that nature of use. The countryside location and flood risk. This application is solely for an attenuation pond and does not propose any built development or would not impact on any precedent of development on this site. So the pond is proposed to be about 10 by 15 metres and set 9 metres from the adjoining land drain. A section was provided as can be seen in the top hand corner of this um, slide and details that confirmed the pond would connect to the land drains with a 150 millimetre diameter concrete pipe with a head wall connecting to the reed, um, connecting the reed to the attenuation basin. The design and capacity of the pond has been agreed with the internal drainage board. The drainage attenuation system is designed to work by providing additional storage capacity for Kidsbury Reed. Um, with the attenuation providing the majority of storage and the connection pipe um, providing additional minor storage. The increase in impermeable um, surfaces for the new residential site at Salerno Court results in an increase in volume of surface water runoff above that of the original surfacing, which was just um, arable grass. So, this additional surface water runoff drains to Kidsbury Room, and the drainage attenuation system provides additional storage capacity to the Kidsbury Room which can be utilised in the event of sustained or extreme storm conditions. The drainage attenuation system is designed to fill with water and drain as the level of Kidbury Green rises and falls during and after storm conditions. So looking at the site, um, hopefully now everyone can see the site photos. Um, looking at the site, um, there is a construction access um, which would be, we utilise the existing field gate, which is off of Nathan's views. Um, and whilst this would cause a degree of impact during construction, once in place, maintenance would occur as and when required, but this is not expected to be more than on an annual basis. The properties fronting Nathan's view adjoin the site on the opposite side of the land drain and present relatively low level and landscape boundaries. Views from these properties would be interrupted during construction, but once the attenuation pond is in place, the outlook would remain comparable to the existing site. So this is a view from further within the site, looking towards the rear of these properties. Um, access to and through the site would be maintained through the nine metre margins around the site surrounding the pond. Concern was raised regarding potential impact on ecology and wildlife, and additional reports were provided. Following this, County Ecology had confirmed no objection to the application and that subject to maintenance, the development would result in an enhancement of the surrounding wildlife. So in summary, whilst the site is located outside the settlement boundary, it is in associated with consented residential development and would not result in an appearance that would be out of keeping or adversely impact on the character of the surrounding area. There will be a degree of impact on the neighbouring properties during construction although this will be fairly short term and is not considered to result in significant harm. The existing access is considered adequate to accommodate the nature and volume of traffic that would be generated and county ecology is satisfied that the development would result in enhancement relative to the existing agricultural land. 
The main purpose of the development is to provide attenuation to the existing site, the nature, um, the volume, the nature, and the scale of which has been agreed by the Internal Drainage Board and the Lead Local Flood Authority. The application is therefore for all members being recommended for conditional approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Dovich, would you like to come forward, please? Just before I remind you, you've got three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock and start when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Councillors. Good morning, Officers. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'd like to object to the application on the following ground. The original site of the attenuation pond to the rear of Savannah Court was the choice of the developer to now say that the original site is unsuitable and wouldn't impact amenities on that development is surprising, to say the least. The construction work would have a major impact on local residents in terms of disruption and work to traffic. The proposed site is inside flood zone three and outside the development boundary. A major development on the same site was rejected three years ago, and there is a fear that this application could establish a precedent for further development on the site. No details of management for ongoing operation and maintenance of the proposed site are included in the application. This lack of information, I think, contravenes policy D1. There is a strong public opposition to this proposal, as can be seen by the 22 letters received from residents and the objections from Wendell Parish Council. The, drain, the drainage for the Salerno Way development should have been sorted at the time of construction and certainly before residents moved into the development. I would suggest that this did bring to regulations. The lack of a highway response is worrying. How will construction traffic and later maintenance vehicles access the site? The proposed site is over 300 metres from the development. It serves the previously past site is adjacent to the dwelling it serves and conforms to regulations and guidance. The retrospective nature of this application shows lack of adherence to regulations and I would urge this committee to reject it. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Start with Councillor Bolt, and then Councillor King. Councillor Bolt? Just see, a couple of questions come to mind. First one, is there any attenuation on site at all at the moment? Um, there was the condition that was discharged um, under the application when they've implemented it in full or not, I, I don't know, but this is um, post in lieu of that. So the, the original permissions were given with the attenuation pond that you showed up in the right hand corner. The original permission was given without the drainage details, which can be commonplace for planning applications, but we conditioned it as condition 12. The details we had um, that I've shown members, which was this one, um, was submitted and discharged under that condition. So they met the requirements of the condition by approving the can anyway on site, but by doing so in this way, it impacts on the immunities of the residential properties. So if to reduce that impact, they would have had to get rid of one or two properties. So that everything would get more spread out. Is that what? This is a financial issue, isn't it? Um, it? It's a lack of red line issue because the red outline of the site isn't big enough for them to attenuate the drainage requirement within the constraints of the original application. So they did look at options um, because the land to the back, um, just to the, to the left hand side, of, if you're looking at it, is um, Wembley Village Green. So the potential to put drainage in there was, was a non-starter because of the impact on the um, public open space. They did try a direct connection into the land drain, um, but you need consents in place before you do that. So it was subject to action, which is why we've subsequently got this application in for the alternative site, because this is the closest they could get it to mitigate the impact. So we're saying that the land drainage have objected to them putting it into their system. They, they objected to the direct connection 
without seeing how that direct con connection could be attenuated. So this is the solution to the direct connection into the land ring. So the decision not to put that attenuation upon which we you say is discharged, it was that before or after the commencement of the buildings? Um, the condition was submitted at about the same time they commenced. Um, it should have been discharged before they commenced, but it wasn't because it's subject to quite a lot of debate um, between ourselves and the Internal Drainage Board and the Lead Local Flood Authority. Um, eventually that was agreed, so there's no breach of condition because they agreed the alternative, they just didn't implement it. So I gather that the houses are occupied now? A number of them are occupied, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor King. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, with this application, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, lot of detail regarding the actual pond, regarding um, security. Obviously, if you've got a pond that's within a residential area, obviously, will there be a fence around this pond? And, you know, children go out and play it and fall in? Yeah. At the moment, um, from this slide, um, there's an agricultural access just in here, so you have to go over the agricultural access to get into the site, and you have to go through a five bar field gate to get to this area of land. Um, this bit at the top shows a section of the site, so this is the reed, and then there's the separation margin, and then this is the basin. What I haven't got currently is any details of any sort of fencing or structures to, to keep anyone out. Um, the land at the moment isn't publicly accessible, it's privately owned. So whether people go onto the site or not. Um, but land reams also run sort of either edge of this field and, and from site visit there's quite a lot of um, planting but not any <coughs> room structures to stop people jumping into land drains. Yeah, Beans are quite nasty for you, small children who have experienced mm -hmm. that in the past. And, uh, there's no, no means of keeping them out of uh, water. The actual access. So the field gate is not stop children getting in. Yeah, I mean, at the moment there's a double field gate on the uh, driveway side. So this is a, um, this location here, just the side of the property. So there's a double field gate there. You go over onto a concrete bridge that, that crosses over the land drain, and then there's another gate beyond that that is, you know, quite screened you have to be really trying to get into the site to get into the site to get pulled into it by accident. But there's probably more reasons why there should be security because if children get in there they can't be seen. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? Yeah. Councillor Scott and then Councillor Pierce. Yeah thank you Chairman. Um I fear that this um, is a slightly over development of the initial site because obviously planning application that was approved had the attenuation pond within the site. Um, regardless of what's happened, um, there should have been amenity around it when the, was, um, when the plans were approved. However, moving on, um, the attenuation pond is now some way away from the development and how is it going to be connected? Um, I haven't heard that that has actually been agreed, um, although the, in principle the um, the scheme has been agreed by the drainage board, which is good. Um, it's just how is it going to get from A to B? Um, as set out within the report and um, the presentation, it, it does connect to the land drains with 150 millimetre diameter concrete pipe and head wall. Um, effectively, it's additional water storage from the land ring. So when the land ring gets to a certain height, the water will then go through this pipe into this pond and sit in this pond until the land green then goes down again and it will flow out the pipe back into the land green. So it's, it's um, almost storm attenuation. Right. So as the water of the green yeah. rises, it will go into the pond, sit in the pond, and then go back in when it goes back down again. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. Okay. And the other question is relating to the, the, the existing permission that obviously has the drainage on site. That I presume could be implemented. It would just compromise the yeah 
if, if this consent wasn't um, favoured by members, if, if members chose to refuse this permission, there is an alternative drainage scheme that can be implemented on site, um, but it does result in less favourable development for future occupiers. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. Well, that leaves a question hanging, doesn't it? <laughs> We're now wondering what the alternative, the term alternative is. Like others, I share real concerns about the fact that the development was allowed with seemingly inadequate um, attenuation provision. And you wonder how that happened. Um, but given we are where we are, um, I don't have a problem so much with the, the proposal, but I can understand why people living there may be concerned about the construction of it because space is very limited and the, the roads are it's you know it's not the easiest of, of areas to navigate anyway. So I, I didn't notice in the conditions any any conditions around the construction and hours of, um, of work. Are there any particular plans for them? Um, there weren't any because of the scale of development. If members felt that because of the location of the development they'd be more comfortable with a construction management plan or hours of work, they could be imposed as additional conditions. I think that would be helpful personally. Okay. Councillor Bolt. You, you used the word less favourable option. Um, could we expand on that, please? Um, in terms of the agreed drainage solution, um, the IDB and the RFA favour more sustainable forms of drainage um, in the first instance, above sort of tanking. So, what could have been done on the site would have been tanking under sort of the highway or parking spaces or something like that. But that's viewed as unsustainable in terms of the hierarchy of drainage structures. So they like to encourage um, sort of more sustainable means such as attenuation basins and sort of drainage ditches because from, from a biodiversity point of view it, it gives some enhancements and improvements but it also has land take that tanking wouldn't have had so the agreed scheme was a compromise in terms of it was a betterment from um, LLFA and IDB point of view in terms of it providing biodiversity enhancements but arguably it's a detrimental sign off in terms of the immediate future residents because it took up the land take that with new development garden areas are often quite tight on sites. So in terms of the layout, this, this was the consent to development. But I do hear members concern about potential for it to have been over development. In terms of 12 houses on that plot, if you take away the attenuation basin and the land um, drainage ditch that's been imposed on it, it seems a fairly reasonable scale of development given the pattern of development within the area and wouldn't have come to officers um, with a concern in terms of overdevelopment. But it is the nature of the attenuation that's gone in under the discharge condition that's caused the awkward arrangement. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still a bit, a bit of a loss. If that's a plan that was approved, then all of this would have been known at the time of the approval. That obviously, it's going to be a very tight build. This and now they've, they've changed their minds and trying to go outside of the, 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 the building line and everything else. I think the drainage solution they were originally proposing was resisted by the IDB. So the, the original drainage solution for this site that wouldn't have resulted on, in um, attenuation on site would have resulted in a direct connection to Kidsby Room um, and possibly tanking within the site. But that, that approach was resisted. Um, under discharge condition. So we imposed a condition for the details of drainage to make sure we knew what it looked like. Um, and this was the sign off through the discharge condition. So it's after we've granted consent, but before they started works, this, this was the scheme that was signed off on. Oh, Councillor Facey. Yes, Chair. Um, okay, where is this one, Chairman? Going back to Councillor Kingham's views, um, unless you've got the talent of your abuse and the minefield, you're not going to keep kids away from that pond, children away from that pond, Can we condition that the pond would have some 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as, long as, it's, yeah, as long as it's less than two metres, they can do it under permitted development, but I can put a condition on to say details of fencing around the attenuation basin should be provided and proposed. Well, it, it, in my view, Chair, it, it was a bit more key that we are trying to be responsible uh, and have to the absence of uh, tearing the material up. Uh, I would like that to move forward, Chair, in this condition. Thank you. So are you moving a recommendation? In that case, yes, sir. Okay. And, and just to, again, another issue was raised obviously by Councillor Pierce, which was asking for the construction management plan and, and details of hours to be conditioned as well. Is, is that part of your yeah, proposal? I'm happy with that, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Or I'm looking for a second now. Councillor Hendry? I'm quite happy to second that, Mr Chairman. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? So as it stands, we have a proposal in front of us, which is to, to grant permission, as outlined in the report, but with the additional conditions relating to construction management plan, uh, hours of operation of the construction, and that fencing should be provided around the around the pond for safety reasons. Right. Is everyone clear on what the proposal is? Yep. Okay. Can, so, can I just interject, oh, please? Yes, please. Can, can we just be clear that the fencing is retained in perpetuity as part of the condition? Yep. Yes, we've got that noted now. Anything else, Ms. Alima? That's it, thank you, Chairman. Okay, and you're again happy with that? Yes. Sir. So we have the rec that, that recommendation has been moved and seconded. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those against? One, two, three, four. Do that one again for me. One, two, three, four, five, six. And have we got any abstentions there? I've got that at 13. Yeah, I've got that. Okay, can we try that again? Those in favour, please show clearly. As Councillor Grant, I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's it. Thank you. And just for clarity, those against, please show again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, lovely. Thank you. So that is carried as uh, eight in favour, six against. Yes. So the commission is granted with those additional conditions. Thank you very much, members. Um, if we move then to the next application, which uh, actually <coughs> don't have to speak in present form, but we're on page six, I think, of the report, and we return to uh, Bridgewater. And it's Ms. Alvin. I think you're uh, presenting this one. Hello, thank you, Chairman. Sorry, I'm just trying to sort out the computer. Can everyone see? Yeah, I can see it's on the screen. Okay. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this sorted right. Okay, here we go. So, um, before us is an application in Bridgewater for the installation of two advertising LED screens to the front of the Palace nightclub in Bridgewater. The application is before members as the applicant's spouse is an elected member of Sedgemoor District Council. The relevant policies from the local plan to be considered are listed. As this is an application for advertisement consent, the only matters for consideration are impacts on amenity and public safety. The application site is in Bridgewater Town Centre to the southeast of um, Pinaolu, sorry if I've mispronounced that, and to the northeast of Broadway. The application seeks consent for the installation of two advertisement screens to the front elevation, as depicted by the yellow lines on the aerial view. The screens are to be installed in place of the existing neon signs. The site is surrounded by a number of buildings with a variety of typical town centre uses. Adjoining the building to the southwest is a bar with a hairdresser and residential properties to the northeast. Opposite the site is a bingo hall, public toilets and residential flats converted from the former tax office. The proposed screens will each measure 4 metres by 0.6 metres. They will effectively be TV screens. On the slide you can see an example of what the screen will look like when not in use. 
When in use, the screens will be much like the advertisement screens at Bedrock Furniture and the Mercure Hotel, also in Bridgewater and shown on this slide. The application site lies within the town centre boundary of Bridgewater and the relevant policies relating to this seek for development to enhance the image of the town centre by offering high quality and varied retail and leisure offers. It is considered that the upgrade of this front facade by installation of the screens will help to improve and regenerate this part of the town. Environmental health have provided a condition to ensure that the light generated by the screen is compliant with professional guidance on the brightness of illuminated advertisements to protect neighbouring residents. The site is adjacent to a Grade 2 listed building and the application site itself is of architectural merit and the screens are not considered to harmfully detract from the character of this historic environment. The screens are viewable from the highway but are unlikely to be confused as a highway sign. The screens do not encroach onto visibility of vehicles or overhang the highway. It is considered that the proposal complies with the relevant local plan policies and as such the office's recommendation is to grant planning permission with conditions including that provided by environmental health. Thank you. Someone has to unmute, I think, so that we can hear you. Apologies. Could you repeat yeah. that, Councillor Evans? Yeah, I'm just querying the heritage asset to the southwest. Could I have clarification on what is the heritage asset to the southwest, please? Is that Sure. So the um, building which has um, Barbara now, that's a way too listed building. Could you repeat that again, just again? The, the, so the building right next to the Palace nightclub where there's um, Barbara now and I think the Link Lounge, that's a Grade 2 listed building. Okay, okay. And to clarify, the Palace is not a Grade 2 listed building. Correct, yeah. Are you sure about that right way around? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. I was surprised it wasn't lifted as well, if I'm totally honest, so I can understand. The question. Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you. Uh, when I read the report, I wasn't particularly have any concerns about this, but when you showed examples of, of other um, boards, I've now become concerned. Um, have you got any more information of the scale and how it would actually look on the building? Because that's key to me. I'm not opposed in principle, but it's the scale of it. Is that it? Sure, I'll just um, bring up the drawing again. Sorry, bear with me. It, <laughs> this remote stuff is easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? Okay, so on the um, on the on the nightclub at the moment, do you see there's these sort of neon signs here? Um, I mean, if you're familiar with the building anyway, it's it's going here basically underneath these two windows. I know the drawings. Um, not great, but hopefully that can explain where it's going. So, so just to confirm, yes. it's in effect between the first floor and the ground floor windows on that bar that we can see going across between them? Yeah, so at the moment there's um, actually neon writing here. I know it's not very clear from these photos, um, yeah. but yeah, on this sort of blank part, that's where it's going. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, that helps. Yes, Councillor Perry. Oh, yes, can I ask, um, are these signs going to be lit permanently all day and all night? I mean, they got time um, when they switched on. Thank you. Is that um, I don't have information to hand about that. Mrs. Fries? Um, just in terms of any members' concerns about the lighting, there is a condition that's being recommended, which is condition three on the report, that just says the lighting scheme should comply with the Institute of Lighting Professionals' guidance for the brightness of illuminated advertisements 2014 or any later version. So it should be designed so that um, the minimum needed for operational process to be installed to minimise potential pollution caused by glare and spillage and maintain three route for development's existence. So there is a condition requiring um, controlling the degree of luminance, 
Um, but we don't have details of the timings of the lunars. But the other adverts that are up and about Bridgewater are on, I think, probably 24 7 advertising different businesses. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? Yes, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. I just wondered, uh, it, it mentions uh, the fact that there are television screens, and I wonder, uh, and it also mentions the word adverts, but it doesn't specify what the adverts are. Are these limited to advertising what's on inside the building, or are they Heinz tomato soup, or what are they? Are they, are they uh, changing adverts being sold as a space? That I would object to because I think that would be detrimental and would create precedent for other buildings throughout, throughout the town. If it's meant to be a, an advertising, it, we do talk about adverts, not just adverts. So can you please tell me, give me some information? Um, uh, I can't say it, I'm going to get it. I, uh, can you give me some information regarding my statement there? This is great. I'd like to comment on it. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Dawn. I was just going to say it's um it's it, it is related to the nightclub um, business itself, but my understanding of planning reg um, regulation is that we can't actually um, restrict what's displayed. I I might be wrong about that. I'm hoping. Dawn will <laughs> I was, was going to say signage. So signage that goes up in front of cafes that is called an advert. It's an advert consent that they have to apply for for that signage. So any signage that goes up anywhere, whether it's signage to a nightclub, signage to a cafe, that, that comes under the advert regulation, so it's classed as an advert. In terms of looking at the size and scale of these, the other examples you've got around Bridgewater are sort of quite large, rectangular, clearly boards to advertise other services. Um, in terms of the size and scale of these ones, it's four metres by 60 centimetres above the venue that they're looking to serve. So my my thought would be it's predominantly to advertise the venue and provide sort of signage opportunities to change and evolve for whatever theme tonight is on that particular night. But as, as an LED screen, that doesn't restrict it being used for other purposes if they wish to. But the size of it being sort of four metres wide and 60 centimetres deep would suggest that it's a facial board to the unit rather than an advert similar to the examples that have been shown. Okay, before anyone comes back, I've got Mr. Howlett and then I've got Ms. Conway to come back as well. So, Mr. Howlett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I was just going to give the experience from the Mercure because I dealt with those uh, media board at the time. And, and, and Dawn's absolutely right. You, you can't restrict uh, what is advertised, but generally they are there to advertise the services of the actual premises, but they, they will include other things like temperature, time. Uh, and potentially other local uh, ad advertisements, which aren't a bad thing. You know, that, that's quite a positive thing in terms of being able to advertise local local events and, and, and goods and services, etc. I suppose what I was going to say is um, I sort of understand a little bit of the concerns about the lack of detail of what the signs would look like. And um, uh, if members are concerned about that, I would imagine what's happened is they won't, the details won't be known, which is why the plans are, are reasonably poor at this stage until the actual um, boards are purchased. So I wonder if there's just a, a condition that gives a bit of comfort to say the details to be submitted, the final sort of brochure details to be submitted before they're erected so that we've got some comfort as to what they look like. And that will that will give us a better idea in terms of what types of adverts, because they, they are quite small strip adverts. They're not huge boardings. And, and in, in fact, whilst I understand why um, Millie's used the other examples. These do feel like they're going to be much more smaller and, and subtle than uh, the Mercure digital boarding. So I think they're going to be really, really subtle. But if, if members need that bit of comfort, then let's get the details in before they're erected, because I sort of do have a degree of sympathy for members. The plans are reasonably um, lacking in detail, aren't they? I finished. Someone on mute. Thank you.
Is it okay if I speak? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, there's microphone issues. Um, so I just wanted to kind of um, agree with what Stuart was saying. Um, I've opened up the application form and it states that um, both signs will be intermittent. The screens will be used for general marketing and advertising of the Palace nightclub and potentially opening it up for the advertisement of other businesses. Um, so whilst I appreciate the signs at Bedrock and Mercure are considerably bigger, it was more just to show the type of screen rather than you know, it's going to be on this size. Um, and also just to back up what Stuart was saying, no more information could be supplied because they were waiting to get consent before they make the order, which you can understand. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, while I'm tempted to propose a site visit on a Friday night, I like the idea of subtly illuminated adverts. I thought the whole point of eliminated adverts was to attract attention not to be subtle. Nevertheless, there are no good planning reasons to to to, 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 to refuse this. So with the with the amended um, re recommendations, I'd like to move it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So that's basically the additional condition that was suggested by Mr. Howlett of, of in effect, submitting the details before it's actually uh, erected and agreed with the planning authority. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, Chairman, with those conditions, I'd like to second it. Okay. Are there any further comments or questions? Ms. Lehman, you're okay with the uh, the additional condition wording? Okay. Thank you. Right. Then we've had the recommendation to grant permission with the additional condition relating to uh, the details to be submitted. Those in favour of that, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six. And those against, please show. And any abstentions? That's clearly carried, so permission is, is granted. Thank you. So, members, as we mentioned earlier, the application on page 14 has been withdrawn from our agenda and is being dealt with under delegated powers. Uh, so, we then move to page 20 and to Burnham. And we'll Absolutely. Okay, is everything just to confirm for those who, who are online that uh, Councillor Henry has, has left the room? Oh. Ms. Elway, if you'd like to uh, introduce this one, then please. Sure, sorry. <laughs> um, right, I can see it's on the screen. Let's... Okay, so um, before us is the application at Magnolia House, 26 Manor Road, Burnham on Sea. Um, this is a retrospective application for full planning permission for the change of use of a B&B to a residential dwelling. The application is before members as the applicant is an elected member of Sedgemoor District Council. In addition to the local plan, the application site is included within the Burnham on Sea and Highbridge area neighbourhood plan. The relevant policies from both plans are listed here, along with the main considerations for this application. The principle of the development, impact on visual and residential amenity, highway safety and flood risk. The application site is within Burnham-on-Sea, slightly to the north and within walking distance of the town centre. The site lies to the southwest of a Class B road and has an existing vehicular access onto this road. The site is surrounded by a number of residential properties and other buildings typical of a town centre location, such as a garage, community centre and library. The application seeks consent for the retrospective change of use of the B&B to a dwelling. No internal or external changes have been made, nor are proposed. The property had previously been a dwelling prior to the change of use to a B&B in 2006, and as such retains a domestic appearance. The property has a total of six ensuite bedrooms across both floors, a kitchen, dining room, utility room, lounge and conservatory. The building is also served by a garden to the rear and a parking area to the front and side. The application site lies within the development boundary for Burnham-on-Sea. A market town in the district is set out in the spatial strategy for Sedgemoor in the local plan. Whilst the change of use has led to a loss of a unit of tourist accommodation, it is considered that there is still an adequate provision of such facility in the area. The principle of the development is therefore considered to be acceptable. No external changes have been made to the building, which retains a domestic appearance due to its previous use as a residential property. 
The site is in an area where there are other residential buildings and its change is therefore not out of keeping with the vicinity. All the rooms are considered to be of an acceptable size and standard in relation to access to adequate natural light. The property benefits from an existing parking and turning area to the front and side of the building, which provides sufficient space for parking of vehicles. It is considered that the change will potentially reduce the number of cars parked here, along with the number of vehicular movements to and from the property. The site does fall within flood zone 3, however the building has existing flood resilience measures already installed due to its previous uses. As the site is within the development boundary, the sequential test is passed. Additionally, as there is no increase in vulnerability, the exception test is also considered passed. As the application has demonstrated compliance with the relevant policies, the officer's recommendation is to grant planning permission with the standard condition to ensure the development is in accordance with the submitted plans and documents. Thank you. Members, any comments or questions, please? I'll start with Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Can I just query why policy D17, retention of existing holiday accommodation, doesn't apply? Thank you. Ms Elvey? Um, I'll ask Dawn to answer this question because I know we had a conversation about it. And one, one moment. Dawn, 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 Dawn DeRay. Yeah, sorry. Can you start that again, please? I was just saying um, I could ask Dawn DeVries to answer for me because I know we had a conversation and she'll okay. work yeah. better than I will. Um, apologies if it's not set out in your report. We did have a discussion about it. In terms of D17, D17 looks to secure tourist uses. Um, when we were looking at this location and this value of tourist asset in terms of B&B and how many bed spaces would be lost, it's within the settlement boundary. There is a lot of other provision within the locality. So it wasn't considered to be a significant impact. So apologies if that wasn't in the report, but the rationale was discussed and it was considered that the loss of a few bedrooms as a B and B, um, reverting the property back to residential, which it was originally, um, wasn't considered to cause an objection against that policy. Councillor Evans, do you want to come back or do you? Yeah, I mean I'm reading the I'm reading the policy and I can't see where that's an exception to it, um, the sequential test under the retention of existing holiday accommodation is quite clear and I don't see that, they see that that test has been made. I'm just struggling to see the bit that you're reading, sorry. Um, retention of existing holiday, no, they were on a paper version of page 141. Change all your property use or remove your conditions, restricting occupation, <coughs> and other use when you get out here. It can be demonstrated that the use is no longer viable. Yeah. This would be normally to a marketing or business for at least two years at a realistic price and supported by an independent market assessment. The, the site has been on the market. I don't know if you've got details of how long it was on the market for. Um, not exactly, no. I know it was for quite a while. So the, the site has been marketed, um, while Millie's having a look for that, the site has been marketed and subject to um, a marketing exercise, um, she can confirm details and timing for that. The accommodation is suitable for residential use, having previously been residential use, and the site is in the middle of the settlement boundary, so it is well related. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm not wearing the second two points on the sequential test, just the first. Yeah. You know, D17 was specifically not mentioned in the report. And I wanted to, to clarify if this is within policy because yeah. of because of the name of the applicant. Okay. If one Ms. Alvey looks for that, uh, I've got Mrs. Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned um, that um, we need to probably address the public sector equality duty because there's a loss of um, um, a tourist accommodation. Um, I just wondered if um, Dawn de Vries can just do a balancing exercise for members. Um, because um, I, I know that we are in flood, flood risk zone three, and I also note that the um, tourist accommodation has been um, not used for considerable considerable amount of time and that tourist accommodation not being used is not in our control but um, perhaps Dawn DeFries can just um, clarify those points. Thank you. 
In, in terms of um, equality duty, there is a responsibility on the local authority we have a duty to give due regard to any potential change of uses and what impact that may have on any people with any protect, protected characteristics. Um, in terms of this site, obviously it would have been used for a B&B, so there is potential that people with protected characteristics could have rented a room um, for a weekend or for a holiday or for a stay. Um, that will no longer be available um, and it will be reverting to a residential property. The residential property will remain as able to be occupied by anyone with any particular characteristics as it, as it would have been um, able to be used as a and b but Obviously there is a net reduction in the amount of space um, because you could have had multiple people occupying a b and at any given time. Um, the change of use, given the former use of the property was residential, um, I don't think causes an undue impact or discrimination on anyone with any protected characteristics. Thank you. Ms. Elvin? Thank you. Just to say that um, I've ha I have had information to say that the property had been marketed for two years. And has it, is, can we confirm that to the realistic price and supported by an independent market assessment? I don't have that information. In which case, I would contend that this is against policy P17. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I know this property quite well. I don't live too far away. There are many bed and breakfasts in this area. Um, I don't think it would be detrimental to, to, to lose a bed and breakfast, to be honest, because there are so many around there. It always used to be residential. Um, it's, it's in a good position. I don't have a problem with this at all, and I'm happy to move the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Listening to a, a more local um, councillor um, near the area and his views on it, I happily second the recommendation. Thank you. Ms. De Vries. Um, just a quick comment on D17. Obviously, the purpose of the condition is to try and secure the continued tourist uses of established tourist sites and tourist accommodation, and in particular, sort of sites that are in isolated locations or in countryside locations. So the test can be viewed quite highly. Um, in terms of context, you know, the level of loss of accommodation is a and b within a residential area with existing b and bs in the surrounding area. It has been marketed for a period of two years. It wasn't picking up. We are on the backside of, of COVID, so there have been um, sort of funds to support these type of businesses get through this period. But based on the evidence that officers have, we're satisfied that there isn't a conflict with D17. Are there any further comments or questions that members have, Council Rivens? So just to clarify, even though it hasn't been supported by an independent market assessment, we are saying it complies with policy P17. We are satisfied that the test should be proportionate to the loss. So in terms of the loss of this, it's a couple of bed and breakfast rooms in a sustainable location where there are plenty of bed and breakfasts in the locality. So it has been marketed for a period of two years. We are happy with the, with the um, marketing demonstration and sales have fallen through on the site. Um, in this case, I don't think it would be reasonable to put it through an independent market um, assessment given the loss and the location of the nature of the tourist accommodation. But if it was um, a countryside location, a tourist development in the middle of the countryside that was being lost, um, it would go through that process because it's a more significant tourist offer. That's not what policy said. The, the policy is should be translated proportionately to the development proposal. And that's obviously the judgment that both officers and members will have to come to in their balancing of the, the relevant issues. Any further comments or questions that members have? We have a recommendation that has been moved and seconded, which is to uh, grant permission. Those in favour of that, please show. Oh, so, and those against, please show. 
And any abstentions? Thank you very much. That is clearly carried, so permission is granted. Remember, that brings us to the end of the planning applications before us this morning. So if I could ask you to turn in your papers to page 75, which is the yeah. planning yeah. Yes, please. Which is the report. Just, just to confirm for those online, if, if you weren't able to, have you got the microphone back on? Yeah. yeah. For those, uh, we did we did announce within the room, but obviously it wasn't heard by the microphone. Um, the vote was uh, 12 in support of granting permission, none against, and one abstention. So permission was granted. As I say, if we just wait one minute while we get the councillors back into the room who left. Existing land use that will be back with enforcement and investigation. 
Um, and there was also a certificate of lawfulness for existing um, laying of an area of hand, hard standing and renewal of existing tracks. That was granted by the Commission. Any questions or comments from members? No. Okay. Um, we've also issued a couple of Section 106 agreements, so one of which was 38 dwellings um, land to the north of Wedding and Birth School. Um, which was access, landscape, parking, public open space, and associated work and off site pedestrian improvements. Um, and we also issued a 106 formation of a new entrance and access track. And that takes us to the end of the reports. Okay, any comments or questions on those? No, in which case, I think, members, that brings us to the end of the, the planning applications and, and reports for this morning. Uh, we'll take a short comfort break at this point and then we'll return for the member training. Uh, they will be taking part physically here, but there are members uh, who will be viewing this remotely and also members of the public who will be viewing on Teams. And we will be addressed later, I think, by at least one speaker who will be coming in through the Teams system. Uh, but I would point out only councillors who are in the room can actually debate and vote on the applications that are before us today. Uh, the format of the meeting will be as per your agendas that have been circulated beforehand, and I would just mention that uh, the officer presentations are available online for, for those who are viewing uh, on the computers. And I would also mention that this meeting is being uh, video recorded and audio recorded, so uh, it will be available later through the internet. Uh, just also to introduce you as to who's in front of you today at the meeting, to my right uh, are representatives of our Democratic Services team, to my left are the officers <coughs> from the planning department, and there will also be presentations from officers remotely. Uh, we also are joined online by our legal team uh, as well. So we have the normal uh, officers who are with us at a, at a standard meeting. On the wings of the table, to my right and left of the councillors, we'll be ultimately debating and deciding the meeting uh, agenda today. So if we move on to the agenda itself, the first item I have is apologies for absence. Are there any apologies we have, please? Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies for this afternoon from Councillor Grimes. Um, Councillor Haywood is um, unable to join us today, but he is there on Teams. Um, he's not had his uh, training at the moment. He's a, our new member, so he will be there. Thank you very much, and all other members are, are present. Uh, item two is urgent business. I, I'm not advised of any urgent business that uh, isn't already covered on our agenda today. Item three is public speaking time for, for members of the public. For those of you who have registered to speak today, the format will follow is that the officers will present each application in turn. They'll give us the outline of the detail and the background. Uh, we'll then ask you as speakers to come up in turn to the speaker's table. Uh, you have three minutes to address the committee. You'll see we've got a clock on the front table and that will show you the time counting down. So it shows you the amount of time you've got left to go. Uh, if I could ask when you do actually speak, if you can um, speak towards the, the microphone that's in the centre of the room, that's the one that's picking up all of our, our voices today for the, for the recording. Uh, and uh, as I say, you will see the time running down. If you can draw your comments to a conclusion within that three minutes, it would be appreciated. Item four is declarations of interest. Uh, before I come to individual members for declarations, I will just do a, a sort of, we've, we've been advised for those of us who are members of the drainage board, um, in either the Parrot area or the Act Brew, we need to declare a what's called a non predetermination declaration. So we have not taken part in the deliberations that drainage boards have taken on these applications. If we did, then we would not be able to get involved with this, uh, this meeting. So, in terms of, of members who are present at the moment, if I just read out the names, uh, it's myself, Councillor Betty, Councillor Hendry, Councillor Kingham. Councillor Murphy, Councillor Pierce, and Councillor Scott. Have I missed anyone out who's on a drainage board? No. So in that case, that is recorded. Are there any other declarations of interest that members have? So we'll come to Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, on page 36, the application in Bridgewater, Western Border Road, 
as just a personal interest, because I remember the individual town council who took no part in this planning application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Same for me. Thank you. Any other declarations from members? Yes, Councillor Scott. Uh, yeah, on the second item, sorry, I don't know which page number it is. Um, I declare a BPI because I will be speaking for this application. Okay, so that's page 45. Page 45. Okay. Just, just to double check, Councillor Scott, I think it was a, a non predetermination declaration you're making as opposed to a okay. DPI would be people of financial interest. Oh, right, okay, but, sorry. But just well, to confirm it, it's not. Yeah, it is. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, Councillor Scott has predetermined it because she has made comment on it. Okay. I've also got to make a declaration on page 45, which is just that it's a non predetermination. Um, I, Cover and in part of my area that I cover as a councillor, uh, the parishes uh, of Chapel Allerton, um, but I've taken no part in the discussion and uh, at any deliberations they've had on it, so therefore I have not predetermined the application. I'm not seeing any other declarations, so just again for members of the public, it's important that you know if there is any background or, or whether members have, have potentially made up their mind on the application beforehand. Where you've heard a declaration today from, from Councillor Scott, where in fact she's commented on the application, she was declared an interest that she has already made up her mind on this application and therefore wouldn't be able to come to this meeting with an open mind to make that decision. So she will speak as ward councillor to the meeting, but then will leave the meeting and it will be up to the rest of the members to make their decision on the application. I'm not seeing any other comments from members, that's fine. So we'll move on then to the planning applications themselves. The first application we have before us, which has a speaker uh, with us today, is on page 36 within the parish of Bridgewater. And I believe, Mr. Noon, you will be presenting this. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this is an application for the erection of a new Class E convenience store. Class E is the new planning use class that captures many uses, uh, but includes A1 retail use as it used to be. Um, there is an area of the existing co-op building that would be demolished, and then the uh, parking would be reconfigured around the new building and the part of the old building that is retained. There, just to identify the site, the, uh, the building with the flat silver roof in the middle of it, uh, railway lines you can see to the west, and on the north side of West Joyland Road, you can see the doctor's uh, surgery just to the west, the, the curved building. Just zooming in a bit more closely, the entrance area to be demolished is the sort of rectangle on the, um, sort of the southwest corner of the building. You can see the existing service arrangements behind that, um, just on the western side of the build, of, of, of the store building, and then the parking is out to the front. As the building exists, just in diagram, diagrammatic form, uh, as with the application, that's the red line for the application site. The access onto Clark's Road would not be changed as part of this application. But within the site, we will get reconfiguration. Um, just in slightly more detail, there is you know, it's quite a lot of parking and surface in the, the existing building. Um, and then you have the service arrangements um, just on to the west of the building. And then the proposal that you can see it, the retained building becomes a straightforward square, having had that entrance to the lobby area removed. The new building is the rectangle in front of it, and the parking is then reconfigured on the western side, um, and the ser a shared service area would be provided between the two buildings. See, so elevations, um, it's a simple rectangular building, originally composed with a flat roof, we sort of amendments the bringing this hip roof style, which does more, more reasonably reflect the large buildings around the site, the principally the doctor's surgery and the retained store. So we felt that was a more appropriate design for this construction. Internally, we have a retail area with a rear uh, back of house area, they're referring to it as a uh, storage and whatnot. And then the little compound at the right hand side there, that's just sort of a fence around 
the area where there would be sort of you know, plants, chillers, that sort of thing, and um, sort of service, a service area off the uh, vehicle service area. Just sort of by comparison, there's the existing layout of the building, quite a lot of back of house area, a bit of a regular shape. Um, but it is, we do accept that this is a larger, uh, it, it is a larger building, the proposed building is smaller than the current one. Uh, just really just to give you the thought, the form of the building um, there is just sort of, uh, there is a pitch roof on it, sort of the flat roof in the middle, uh, reflecting the design of the scheme at the time. We've sought to replicate that sort of building form, the roof form, with the new building. Um, this is what they proposed by way of retained retail area in the original building. Um, they're saying that you know, there would just simply be a gross internal floor area of about 1,100 square metres for a n other retailer to operate from. So we wouldn't lose the existing store, but the convenience element would move over to the new store. We went on to some photographs, um, just looking into the site, the, the green sign you can see, uh, that's on the sort of entrance area of the bit to be demolished. You see sort of quite a lot of parking, quite a lot of vacant spaces. It's, it's probably over provided for by way of modern standards, but reflects what was agreed back in I think, about 1990. And just a bit more detail, there's the entrance building. Um, it's quite a large structure, but that, is, that goes as half of this application. And then just swinging the camera around a little bit, there's the service area where the grey vehicle is parked. And then just looking from the other side, courtesy of Google, uh, you can just see the view into the service area and that access of Clark's Road, that is unchanged. In terms of the key issues, we are dealing with an existing neighbourhood centre as allocated in the local plan, it's within the settlement boundary. As such, in principle, there is not considered to be any objection to a, an additional store. This would maintain local service provision. Uh, whilst there is a reduction in uh, floor space, that is an issue that's been raised by Tampa, and I'll just come to that in a second. That, you know, it, there is no policy that seeks to retain convenient shopping at a certain floor area. So we also note that the retained store would remain available and would need a further application because there is a condition on it from the original 1990 approval that says it should be convenient uh, and convenience goods and grocery only. So to go to another user would require an application to vary that condition. In terms of design, uh, the pitch roof is considered to be an appropriate form of building in this location. With regard to the living conditions of adjoining residential occupiers, it's an additional store building in a location where there is already a store building. It is considered that the use is compatible. Uh, there are, uh, the environmental health have recommended a condition you know, that would control noise. In highways terms, the parking level would be retained at the appropriate level for both units, and in the absence of any changes to the access, there's no objection to that. By way of the quick updates, the town council have confirmed that they object. Um, they know that there is a retail objective is to provide and promote a range and mix of retail facilities within the neighbourhood centre. Therefore, the loss of the existing services and facilities to meet, that meet the day-to-day -day needs of the community will be lost. That would be contrary in their view to policy D19. Um, and they object to the loss of valuable facilities that meets the needs of the local community. Now, as I've said, there isn't a loss of the existing retail. That would remain. We are suggesting a condition of a new building to ensure that that remains as a, a grocery provision building. So we have control over, we would have control over both buildings. And in the event that an application were to be made to remove a condition on either unit, we would be able to consider that as a policy principle, namely retention and retail and grocery function in a neighbourhood centre. So on that basis, and whilst I do acknowledge the concerns of the town council, in this instance, we recommend it. Thank you very much. You'll see that we have a speaker, um, Mr. James Bergeron, who I believe is joining us through Teams, although I'm not sure. If, if Mr. Bergeron, if you could enable your microphone. There we go. Yes, sir. Working. 
could you if you could just uh, if you could just speak just to make sure we can hear you at this end sorry can you can you hear me uh, we can very faintly but i don't we're just going to see if we can can dial you up a little bit to uh, if you could just uh, again introduce yourself and, and just so we can get a sound check please this end yep good afternoon my name is james bergen i'm the planning agent for the application okay can we is, is there any way we can dial up the volume at all on on mr bergen I'll, um, I'll try and speak up as well. Well, just, just bear with us one minute. We are just having a look to see if we can consult this. The other thing I'll mention to you, Mr. Bergen, is that um, obviously you can't see, you can't see the <laughs> clock on the front of the, of the meeting. So you will have the three minutes, as I described earlier. What I will do is actually, when you've got a minute to go, I'll just chip in on you and just say there's a minute to go. So be, be aware that that will, that will happen and hopefully won't put you off your stride too much. But, no, that's uh, fine. Thank you. We're just sorting out the volume here at the moment. Again, if you can just uh, try speaking to us, I think Adrian, you need to go on mute for the microphone here in the. Um, is, that, is that better? Yeah, yes. I think that, that's a lot better. So uh, great. Oh, I've lost it's the sounds disappeared at my end now. Me. I'll be back on. Be back on okay, Mr. Berger, start when you're ready. Um, and as I say, I'll chip in when you've got one minute left to go. So please start. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to speak and for allowing me to do so remotely. Uh, the application proposals before you seek to redevelop the part of an existing car park to provide a classy, convenient store following the closure of the existing large car store. The site itself, as noted, is located within a defined neighbourhood centre. The concerns raised uh, by Councillor Bartlett and those within the two neighbouring objectives are noted, particularly the concerns regarding a potential reduction in the range of the product in comparison with the existing store and that residents will struggle by having to travel elsewhere to obtain these. The existing large co-op store will ultimately close as it does not align with the co-op's retail strategy, which is to concentrate on smaller convenience stores which can open all day on Sundays. The store, the existing large co-op store, will be made available for reoccupation, and this will most likely be by a non-food retailer subject to planning permission. The co-op assesses the local demographic of all of their proposed stores in order to identify the suitable type and amount of product that it will sell. The proposed store will in effect provide a reprovision of convenience food and goods from the neighbourhood centre, meaning that local residents will not need to travel elsewhere for their day-to-day -day convenience items. We are generally happy with the conditions proposed within your officer's report, however we do have concerns about the wording of condition 7. There is no planning definition of groceries nor household convenience items. The condition is therefore, in our opinion, overly restrictive and open to interpretation. The proposals are simply for a classy convenience store, which will sell essential food and groceries, but also other household products as appropriate. We therefore consider that conditions have been necessary and request that this is not involved. You've got one minute left to go. In the absence of any technical or policy objections, the application proposals are considered to be acceptable. I would like to thank you for your time and respectfully request that you approve the application in line with your officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I come to members, I'll go to Mr. Noon if you wanted to just comment on the, the issue particularly that was raised about the uh, condition seven, I think it was. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, the reference to groceries and convenience goods was essentially, it has, I have lifted that from the condition that is on the current building. I don't see any problem in interpreting groceries or convenience goods in the context of what is being sold from a store such as this. So I don't foresee any difficulty in understanding or enforcing that condition 
uh, should it come to that in the future. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Start with Councillor Revenant, then, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for the presentation, Mr. Noon. I'm just reading policy DAT and the paragraph that neighbourhood centres, um, which seems to me to indicate that the loss of existing services and facilities that meet the day to day needs of the communities will be resisted unless an overriding justification can be demonstrated. I, what is the overriding justification for this, uh, this proposal? Um, because it will lead to a loss of facilities for the local community. Uh, yes, I, I think that that strand of policy needs to be read in the, in the context of the total loss. In this instance, the existing store is retained. The existing store is still available for the sale of groceries and convenience goods, and we have a replacement store that fits with this particular operator's business operation. So I don't think they need to demonstrate an overriding um, justification because we would end up with two stores, both of which could sell groceries, and there's nothing in the policy that says a reduction in floor area is uh, automatically objectionable. Isn't a reduction in floor area a reduction in facilities and services? It's a reduction, yes, but the policy does say the loss of. And I don't think we're dealing with a situation where the loss would occur. I, I think it's a semantic point that how we interpret the word loss in that paragraph. I think that's, that's where the town council and the ward member may, may, may get over here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. I think it's partially been answered. I'm slightly confused as to which element was grocery and which wasn't. Um, so could we just say so that the existing store which will be uh, modified is the non... Well, it, it's a classification which could include groceries but not wholly groceries, is that right? And the new store can you just can you just clarify for me the definition of the two? I know you've told us, but I remain a little confused. Mr. Newton. Thank you. Um, the existing store, so the Ripper Square at the top here, that is subject to a condition that limits its retail activities to groceries and um, household convenience items. Now that was what was imposed on it with the grant of permission in the 1990s. Yeah. Um, I, believe that's reasonably straightforward to understand the concept of groceries and household convenience items. Um, I'm suggesting the same restriction on the new store so that you know, we have equal pegging there. Um, the application does say that it is likely that the existing store will come back as a non-retail use. Now I would say that will need a planning application to vary that condition. Um, so, you know, that may be the issue where we, we, we've got a loss issue to, uh, to, to, to address. But in this instance, the floor area, I mean, it is arguable that the floor area for retail, groceries and household convenience goods, is, is actually extended by this application. And the fear that the other one will fall out of groceries, well, yeah, we might have our views on the likelihood of that, but until we present it with an application, it's difficult to, you know, to assume that for the purposes of this application. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Councillor. <coughs> I personally don't see any problem with this at all. It's on the same plot of land as it originally is. The, the footprint of any, any um, configuration is pretty well very reservated. There's not a huge amount of potential. It's not worth a big debate on Councillor's. Any stores like this are going to be a bit diverse from the days. Councillor Henry, can I get you to speak up a little bit? I'm I think people are having difficulty hearing slightly. It's, it's just my voice. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How's that? Is that a bit better? Uh, a project like this and a development like this, they have to be allowed to be a bit diverse. You know, they want to change what they want to sell and then again, it's, it's, not, it's not against the planning application. 
overall, but because it's given the same food chain, trading well, it's the same dollar land, you have to be a little bit diverse and what the same thing again in a smaller way. I have no problem with this at all. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? I'm not sick. Yes, I am. Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, well, it's, it's, I know it quite well because I don't live too far from it. Uh, and the various disguises and different owners that it's had over the years. Uh, but I've noticed something that is getting busier and busier with the stories that exist today. And there's, it's more and more car, the car park space is getting filled up quicker than it ever did before. There's far more customers using it. Uh, and it's not all that convenient to get to go down the, the road, you know, uh, to park anywhere else. The, the, other, the other thing I'm saying is if they reduce the floor spacing by as much as they are, you know, you're going to have less choice in the store. Uh, no commercial values are not something for the planning committee. But I think it will be, you know, it will hurt the area and uh, there'll be a there will be a lack of choice of the amount of the goods available. And uh, I, in principle, I, I, I don't think it's a, it's a very good move for the neighbourhood area. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? <coughs> yes, Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to say, actually, agree with us, uh, Councillor Hendry, because the application before us is to increase the store area by this new building. The original um, building, the question of what it would be used for at the moment is in, up in the air, but there is the likelihood that there is going to be another store there given the planning permission in the future. So actually you're giving the locals more choice of something possibly. And the, the new store um, <clears throat> the co-op obviously has its reasons for doing this, as explained um, by the gentleman that spoke. Um, so I don't think we can penalise the co-op for actually wanting to do this. So I fully support it and I move to the recommendation. Thank you very much. Councillor Bolt. <clears throat> they talk about facilities here. It would be a shame to lose the facility if the um, co-op decided that it just wasn't the, the, the right business for them without changing the, the, the size of their shop. Um, and I think with that in mind, we need to keep the, the local shops there. And as Councillor Scott said, potentially it's going to um, increase the, the variety of product which is going to be available to the community. And on that matter, I'm, I'm quite happy to second that. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you. Can I just check that is with the condition for both units to be for groceries and household items? Yes, sir. Thank you. Could you just verbally confirm that? No, <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, this application does not include any proposal to lift the condition on the existing building, and I am recommending in Condition 7, whilst I have a disagreement with the agents of the wording, but I am recommending that the same restriction be placed on the new store. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other comments from any other members, so we have a recommendation then that has been moved and seconded to, to grant permission. Uh, those in favour of that, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And any against, please indicate. One, two. And that's all. All those opposed? Yes. So that is clearly carried. So there were 11 votes in support, two votes against. So permission is granted. Right, members, if you move to the next application where we have a we have speakers present, uh, that's on page 45. We're moving to the parish of Chapel Allerton. And okay, I couldn't see everyone on the screen. She's there. Okay, um, Ms. Chorley, I think you're presenting this one. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is an application for the outline permission uh, oh. with all matters 
Já estou. Oh, hold on there, mate. We, we couldn't hear the. Oh, I can't hear you. Again, please, Emma, because we lost the, the beginning of that with the uh, the sound. It, it takes us a little while to switch from. Okay. Yeah, we're with you now. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, apologies. Yes, this is an outline application with all matters reserved for the erection of an agricultural workers' dwelling at Stone Allerton Drove. Um, to begin with, I do have a verbal update for members. Uh, following sight of the officer's report, the applicant has asked for uh, me to clarify that the co-owners of the land um, that will be discussed during the presentation and are referred to in the officer's report uh, don't have any control over it. Um, the statement's been received from the applicant. Um, we don't have any um, kind of confirmation of that, but um, it's just to highlight that to you. Um, in addition, there is an error in the report. It's referenced therein that there are two existing buildings and an application under consideration for one further building. Um, in addition to that, deemed consent was also obtained for a further agricultural building earlier this year um, under application reference 15215. Um, so my apologies for that omission. Um, as we come to the plans, I will indicate uh, to members where, um, if implemented, that building would be cited. Uh, we have also, since the publication of the officer's report, received notification from the CPRE of their wish to raise an objection to the application. Um, so whilst not referred to in the officer's report, their comments are uh, available online um, and their objection is on the grounds of impact to the landscape character. Uh, finally, for clarification, again, the applications referred to in the other relevant history are deemed to be relevant. Uh, not because they have the same applicant necessarily, or but because there is an overlap of land holdings um, as referred to in the officer's report. Uh, so just to begin with the application itself, um, you can here is a wider view of the site and the surrounding area. Uh, the application site is highlighted here in yellow to the bottom left corner of your screens. Uh, the site is located approximately 190 metres southwest of the edge of Stone Allerton, which you can just see here. Um, and south of Badgeworth uh, to the to the northwest and the top of, of the image you can see we're there. The applicant currently resides at Brinscombe Farm uh, to the top right hand corner of the screen and that's approximately 2.4 miles from the application site. Here we've got a closer view of the application site itself again highlighted in yellow so we're looking at this area here. Uh, since the aerial image was produced, there are two agricultural buildings that have been permitted and constructed on site. Um, and as mentioned, deemed consent has been received for a third building. And we do have an application in for one further one. Uh, so the existing agricultural buildings can be seen here um, on the submitted site plan and the location plan. Uh, the first building has permission for the storage of hay and straw and forage, whilst the second is granted uh, consent to house cattle. So this is the first building here and the second building. Um, paragraph uh, 5.24 of the agricultural appraisal um, confirms that the two constructed buildings are being used, one as a general purpose building and the second to ha house livestock um, for the housing of pigs, storage of straw and machinery and is used for lambing as well. Um, as mentioned, uh, there is deemed consent for a further building. Um, if that was implemented, that would be approximately here. And there is another application under consideration for a larger building and that uh, seeks uh, consent for a permission for a building approximately here. OK, so to move on to some site photos, just to give you some context, um, we start with um, the access to the site. The first is looking in a westerly direction further down the drove, and the second is looking northeast um, towards the village of Stone Allerton. The application is for outline permission only uh, with all matters reserved. And this is an existing access point. Uh, this image is taken from within the site, looking back towards the access there. You can just see in the distance and to the right, you can see the first of the existing agricultural buildings. Uh, this view is taken from the access from Stone Allerton Drove, looking into the site. Uh, the recently constructed buildings are in the forefront and the application site would be to the right of your, of your image here. This image is taken along the most northerly boundary, looking towards the second of the agricultural buildings you could see from the access. And this is the building granted consent in 2020. 
Similarly, this image is looking at the other building, the first as you walk into the site. Um, as you can see, both buildings are of approximately the same kind of size and scale, both typical modern agricultural buildings. That building was granted consent under a prior approval application in 2016. And this photo is taken just in front of those existing buildings, looking kind of southwest towards the, the existing field. Um, from the photos at the time, uh, there was little evidence of any kind of particularly established agricultural activity on the site. Um, wouldn't necessarily be unexpected for livestock buildings to be underused at this time of year, though. Um, and there does remain conditions to discharge relating to uh, one of the agricultural buildings still. Finally, this photo is taken from the far end of the field, looking back up towards the application site, which would sit here. And you can see the um, newly constructed buildings um, there in the distance. OK, so to the principle of development, um, the proposal is for outline consent for the erection of a dwelling. Uh, paragraph 79 of the MPPF provides that planning policy should avoid the development of isolated homes in the countryside unless specific circumstances apply. One such circumstance is where it's to meet the essential need for a rural worker and our local plan policy D10 provides an exception policy at local level uh, that sets out where such proposals can be supported, where there is a clearly established existing functional need for somebody to live at their place of work and that can't be met by any existing dwelling or conversion of buildings on that holding. Um, it's for a rural business that has been established for at least three years, it's profitable and has a prospect of remaining so, and that the application site is well related to the rural business and the functional need. Um, it does go on to say that wherever possible it should be sited within a hamlet or existing group of building and that the size of the dwelling should be commensurate with the essential need. Um, it's important to note that the permissions aren't personal, um, they are restricted rather for an agricultural worker or the needs for a rural worker um, in respect of the business um, details that we uh, have been submitted at the time. Uh, so what is a clearly established existing functional need? Um, it is an exception policy and as such it's acceptable where it is to meet only a, clearly need that, a clear need that can't be met as well. Uh, to begin it's necessary to establish if it's essential for one or more workers to be on the site at any one time. Such a requirement would normally arise where there's a need for somebody to be on hand most of the night and day and most frequently occurs with large kind of cattle operations. A functional need differs from that of convenience and permission should only be granted where a functional need exists, should relate to full time employment and the man hour calculations form kind of one part of the assessment when we're looking at the needs of the holding. Uh, so the following livestock um, is, is uh, confirmed as being held at the time of the application um, and in terms of the kind of nature of the enterprise it is described as primarily a beef enterprise uh, based on the level of livestock and the man hours in association with the grassland as well to be maintained uh, it is confirmed that the man hour, hour calculation shows a need for one full-time worker um, in terms of the nature of the activities on site, um, the agricultural appraisal provides that the buildings at the tenanted land, which we'll show in plan form in a moment, are no longer usable and the location of the new buildings at Stone Allerton mean there is no one on site to tend to or look after any of the stock. So this plan has been provided um, in support of the application and sets out the extent of the owned land. It amounts to approximately 102 acres and the application site is for ease of reference highlighted here uh, with the Blue Cross. A land registry checks do confirm that the applicant is the joint owner of the land owned uh, together with other parties. The applicant currently resides at Brinscombe Farm from where there is already a substantial agricultural holding um, in operation and for which there are two extant consents for agricultural workers dwellings. One at Brinscombe Farm, Elmfield Piggeries and the second at Copswood Lane and Stone Allerton. The applicant advises that their holding is entirely separate from the operations um, operated from Brinscombe Farm. As referred to in the officer's report, the land that forms the application site has been used um, as part of the justification for one of those agricultural workers' dwellings for which permission has been granted, the one at Copswood Lane. The relevance of this history is that the same land has obviously already been used as part of the justification for an agricultural workers' dwelling. And as I mentioned earlier, they're not necessarily personal permissions. This plan shows the rented land located at Clua, um, and this forms approximately 135 acres. So the rented land does form kind of the bulk um, of the land holding for the applicant. Uh, the applicant has confirmed that this is also where the dilapidated buildings uh, referred to in the application are located, so where the livestock is effectively being relocated from. 
um, and it's there are there are buildings here that's been confirmed by the agent to to be uh, those that are referred to. Um, as referred to in the officer's report, the land was used as part of the agricultural holding for an agricultural workers' dwellings located at Brinscombe Farm, Elmfield Piggeries. Uh, the relevance of this history is, as I mentioned with the, the owned land, is that the same land has already been used as part of the justification for an agricultural workers dwelling. Uh, that dwelling is under construction at the moment. Um, the application was um, made by the applicant's partner, um, not the applicants themselves. It was claimed at the time that the holding required two agricultural workers dwellings. Uh, to meet their needs, one at Copswood Lane, for which there is an extant consent and material start has has uh, has happened there, and the second at the Brinscombe Farm Elmfield Piggery site, uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, consent's granted and is now under construction. Now it's the overlap of the land holding for the consent of the agricultural workers dwelling um, that's a key issue, and that's been raised with the applicant, who's confirmed that whilst they live at Brinscombe Farm, they run an entirely separate holding. Um, and that uh, with regards to the overlap of holdings, the applicant has no legal interest in either of the application sites uh, for which there are extant consents. So just to give you a bit of context of what we're talking about geographically, here to the bottom corner, you can see uh, the application site. And hopefully here you will be able to see indicated the Copswood Lane site where there is an extant consent for an agricultural workers dwelling already. Uh, this is where the applicant resides at the moment at Brinscombe Farm. And this is uh, where the buildings are, um, the agricultural buildings, the dilapidated buildings um, for the rented land, which kind of goes off uh, slightly off the screen as well. Um, in terms of relative distances, and these are taking from kind of a route calculator if, if you were driving, Brinscombe Farm is located approximately a 3.8 mile drive from the rented land at Clewer whilst Brinscombe Farm is located approximately 2.4 miles from the owned land and the application site of Stone Allerton. And the application site is located approximately 3.5 miles from the rented land at Clewer. So just to summarise in terms of policy D10, the man hour calculation does provide that there is a need for one full time worker um, on the basis of the information that's been provided. Uh, this is just one part of the assessment. Um, overall, it is considered there is a lack of evidence to meet the essential accommodation needs of a rural worker in this location, and insufficient evidence as to why accommodation would be needed for the applicant that cannot be adequately met by their existing accommodation and all the extant consents that have been granted in connection with each of the land parcels, either owned or rented. Uh, the applicant has advised since the application was submitted that further land has now been acquired um, and this is at various locations across the Sedgemoor and Mendip districts and this is used primarily for sheep grazing. Um, so there is a clear overlap of land holdings for extant consents for agricultural workers dwellings already associated with the land um, and as such on the basis of the information and evidence that's been provided at the moment is not considered that uh, the application meets the policy tests. Um, for uh, this exception policy um, for uh, the need for the applicant to be on site um, or that can't be met by their existing accommodation needs or indeed any of those extant consents. Um, therefore, it would result in an isolated dwelling in the countryside and unsustainable development. Uh, moving on to the landscape visual impact, the application site is located on the kind of Allerton Moor. Um, policy D19 states that policy should ensure that enhanced landscape quality and there's no significant adverse impact on the local landscape character. Um, currently, any development in the area is um, very limited. It's quite an open landscape um, and the development that is there is low level, uh, relatively modest agricultural development um, in an otherwise as I say, very open landscape area. Um, the introduction of re residential use would obviously bring in um, quite a different form um, and in our view would be harmful um, to the landscape character and in the absence of justification that such a development in this countryside location is necessary, the harm would outweigh the benefits um, and thus it's contrary to policy D19. So just to summarise, whilst it may be convenient to live at the site, it is not considered that it has been demonstrated as necessary to meet a clearly established functional need, as we looked at with in terms of distances, relocating the livestock to the buildings here, they are would appear closer 
to where the applicant currently resides and certainly to where both of the extent consents are um, than the current arrangement. Um, it's not been demonstrated why any of the out of hours needs could not be met from that existing accommodation for all the dwellings for which there is extant consents. And whilst the applicant does provide that they and their partner both do run entirely separate holdings, an agricultural workers dwelling has already been consented for the area of land that forms part of this land holding. Um, the applicant hasn't provided sufficient evidence as to why the ongoing accommodation needs can't be met through the existing accommodation or the dwellings for which are extant consents. And in our view, as mentioned, the introduction of the residential development would give rise to unacceptable landscape impacts. Um, and therefore, it's my recommendation that permission is refused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you'll see, members, we've got a number of speakers on this application. So if we start with uh, Hugh Williams from the CPRE. Would you like to come forward, please? Good afternoon. Just again to remind you, you've got three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock, so start whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, councillors. I'm Hugh Williams, the Deputy Chair of CPRE Sunset. We support the recommendations made by your senior planning officer and the parish council to refuse this application. Firstly, as detailed in the officer's report, there's no reference in the planning application to two previously consented agricultural dwellings located in the nearby facility or vicinity in relation to this small farming enterprise. There is no answer online from the applicant or her agent to the planning officer's queries of the 2nd of July on this subject. We asked the council to take account of the village design statement, which was adopted by the council on the 16th of July 2003, and of the updated village design statement, which is close to completion. The guidelines in the 2003 adapted statement provided that new development will be expected to respect the historic character and pattern of Stone Arthur. The updated 2021 village design statement highlights that Allerton Moor has remained unbuilt for centuries and has always been used for low intensity, light summer grazing, requiring limited human activity. This has always been an accepted and historic practice, and as a result, this is a unique wetlands habitat for all types of wildlife, including aquatic species, wetland birds, and rare species of bats. The entirely remote and tranquil character of Allerton Moor will be changed permanently if housing and its associated lighting were to be allowed at this location, and it would set a dangerous precedent for other applicants. An appeal was dismissed in May 2020 on the other side of the lane from the site of this application regarding an application for a prior approval for the proposed change of use of a barn to a residence. The appeal inspector ruled that the council had excluded permitted development rights at this location on the wall. It would be inconsistent with this appeal decision to permit a new building opposite. In conclusion, Mr Chairman, this is a special and valuable landscape in Sedgemoor and CPRE Somerset respectfully request it should remain protected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Margaret Wallach. If you'd like to come forward, please. Good afternoon. Just to confirm, you're speaking on behalf of the Parish Council. Today. I am speaking on behalf of the Parish Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So start whenever you're ready. My name is Margaret Wallach, and I am a Treble Allerton Parish Councillor. The Treble Allerton Parish Council uh, wants to, has objected to this application um, on the following grounds. As the Officer of the District Council has said the proposed dwelling is on the Allerton Mall, which is outside the village envelope and is in an area largely unbuilt upon. Important to note that Allerton, Allerton and Bingham Moors make up more than half of the Chapel Allerton Parish. They have remained as an unbuilt area of low intensity, low input farming in the as the recently completed village design statement, the vast majority of the community was against development on the moor. That village design statement was done after considerable consultation with the village uh, using a survey, both online and on paper. And as I said, the vast majority were against development. 
Also, consideration should be given to Section 118 of the National Planning Framework, which states that decisions should recognise that some undeveloped land perform many functions, such as for wildlife, recreation, flood mitigation. This house would not fit within that policy and would cause light pollution and so darken the dark area of the moor. It would be contrary to policy D19, which seeks to protect the countryside. Also, the dwelling is on the very edge of the uh, uh, area and is very close to historic hedge. Whilst the actual development is not in a is in flood zone one, consideration should be given to the Environment Agency flood map attached to the Strategic Flood Assessment Report, which shows the surrounding area in flood zone three B, the zone D B greatest risk of flooding. And bear in mind that this is a house; the long term should be looked at. The proposed site of the house is immediately adjacent to the green and this could cause contamination in a very environmentally sensitive area. Consideration should also be given to the fact that the field is of historic interest, as it is a possible site for an ancient salt home workings, which covers quite a, an area of the site. This latter part has only just come to light, and I think it's a very important consideration. Finally, the position of the house is very close to the current agricultural farms, and uh, that could pose a uh, hazard to health and safety. And lastly, uh, the District Council required that no external lighting be committed to the applicant's recently approved agricultural buildings, and clearly a house would need external lighting in order for protection of the residents as well as their safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Councillor Scott. Like to come forward. Is the applicant not speaking now? Yeah, the applicant is up. Yeah. Okay, okay Councillor Scott, as you well know, you've got three minutes, so start when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Um, the applicant, Kate Isker, a single mother with two teenage sons, both interested in farming should be congratulated and encouraged in what they've achieved in the past 15 years. A fifth generation farmer now owning 100 acres of land and investing in new purpose made buildings, fit for purpose to ensure the biosecurity and high health status for herd and flock, all required by buyers of meat and also tight government restriction and regulation. With over 200 breeding stock on this holding, it would probably give rise to stock in excess of 500 animals during the year. With this number of animals, you need grass and acres to feed them. 100 owned acres, 100 owned acres would be insufficient land, so additional rental grass keep is crucial to maintain these animals over the grazing season and to make conserve fodder for the winter months, hence rent, rented acres wherever possible. <clears throat> the officer has brought into question the farming activities of this young lady, the relevant history stated in the report does not pertain to her personal business activities and extant consents referred to in the report relates to separate business activities owned and run by someone else. Chapel Allerton, a small village, has several main farmhouses scattered within the village boundary. Their life and days is working farms with a handful of milking cows and sheep well over. The village concept of farms has changed. <clears throat> Who wants 200 breeding animals? in a village cluster during winter housing, November, November to April, with the noise, smell and nuisance next to your clean farmhouse. With strict government regulation and control, with the welfare of the animals high on the agenda, farming has moved into the 21st century. A modern purpose-built set up on the edge of the village is more desirable for the village and farmers. It's important to remember that the landscape in this part of the world is farm grassland, one that has evolved over the centuries of agricultural practice, raising sheep and cattle with the old horse or two. So I'm supporting this application on the grounds that it does meet our policy D10 for sustainable farmhouse in the country, location in a place of work. It's important to have the welfare standards when you're dealing with animals during calving and lambing. The applicant has 15 years commitment with extensive investment in both stock and building, 
and has proved a profitable and sustainable business. In addition, policy S5 supports opportunities for local food production and farming. <clears throat> I therefore commend you to support this application on its own merits to ensure the continuity of a committed farming family into a sixth generation. Conditions to control lighting and landscape can be added by condition. Perfectly timed for well. thank you, Councillor Scott. Thank you. And if I could ask Katie Scott to come forward, please. Good afternoon again. Just to remind you, you'll see the time on the clock, so start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Isgar and I am the applicant to which this application relates. My family have been farming in the local area for generations. In fact, I'm a fifth generation female, relatively young farmer. Since 2006, when I bought my first block of land, I've invested nearly £400,000 in purchasing land and erecting buildings. I wasn't able to buy the land without the help of the two guarantors, as confirmed on the land registry checks. In 2016, I gained permission for the first shed, another in 20, a third in 21, and currently have a fourth under consideration, which the parish council supported only last night. I have a separate herd of mainly native shorthorn cows, store cattle, a pedigree flock of Dutch spotted sheep, and a commercial flock of ewes. I have over 20 pigs and a handful of goats. Apart from my two sons, farming is my life, my passion, and my hobby all wrapped into one. My two sons, who are here today, work for me on the farm, and our future plans are to increase the farming enterprise together as a family. I farm around 300 acres, of which 100 is owned land. The planning officer has recommended this application for refusal, basically because of who I live with. I am not married, and I have, or have a civil partnership. I have a personal relationship with someone who, which does not include any business interests. I did not know that who you lived with was a planning issue. The consents to which the planning officer refers were not submitted by myself, and nor do I have any financial interest in the land. In fact, no land registry checks were carried out on the 2018 application. So how can this be a fair process when each individual officer carries out different checks on rural dwelling applications? The refusal recommendation states it would be contrary to policy D10 of the local plan. However, if the application is looked on its own merits and not the consents which I have nothing to do with, then I feel that my, does, my business does meet these policies. None of the governing bodies have raised any objection to this application and the applications from the Parish Council, whose objection was not unanimous, are mainly if the application was to be approved to reserve matters. If approved, I would be applying for a bungalow, which would be non-intrusive as there are nearly 20 foot hedges around the field and I'd be using renewable energy, which would mean it would be a totally sustainable farming enterprise with a very low, low, low carbon footprint. From the generation before my own, there were 25 farms in the Chapel Allerton Parish and today there is five, including myself. Unfortunately, there are no council farms in this area any longer due to them being sold and agriculturally tied houses having the ties lifted or certificates of lawfulness being applied. The amount of land in Allerton Moor hasn't changed and therefore the agricultural need is there, but the farms are no longer. Hence the need to build new farms and I see that my farm is ideally situated on the outskirts of the village just as you reach the moor. The application site is 190 metres from the last house, so not totally isolated. Not many farms have the benefit of being ring fenced, and land sometimes is further away, but from looking through other applications, this doesn't seem to have been a problem before. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Concludes the, the public speakers. Just before I come to members, I will come to officers if there's any issues they want to pick up on. The one thing I would just say beforehand is, is the comment was made about whether this, was, whether the decision that was being made by the officers was relating to who the applicant was or who they they live with. As the officers were mentioning earlier, what the issue is that they they have concerns about is the land that is being used to justify this application may have been used to justify other similar applications, and that's the issue, not as to who the applicant is or who they live with. It's the whether the land that's being cited is being cited in more than one case to justify agricultural workers' dwellings. But I'll come to, do we want to go to Mr. Mr. Chorley first or to Mr. Noon? If I may, Mr. Noon, just, just really to pick up on the um, mention for, about the British Design Statement. Um, the British Design Statement really seeks to guide, the, the intent is that it will guide the design of the house. 
Um, it also, I believe, makes mention of locations for houses. Now, obviously, an agricultural worker's dwelling, if justified, is an exception to the normal rule uh, or presumption against houses in the countryside. So we couldn't take the British design statements sort of um, antipathy towards rural dwellings outside the settlement area as a reason for refusal here. If we were to be recommending approval, then obviously, come reserve matters, the design of the house would then be a material consideration and the British design statement would certainly guide us in that. Um, and the other points that were mentioned are those figures, yeah, again, you know, if we were recommending approval, then the, the conditions could control matters of archaeology and design, uh, uh, materials, uh, lighting, etc. Um, it was mentioned that the uh, flood zone issue, I'm just checking, it is in, it is in flood zone one, so it's not an area at risk of flowing. Um, so that, in terms of the determination of the is where we go on that issue. Um, so I think that's the point I'm just raising the floor just now. And Ms. Jordan, was there anything you wanted to add before I come to members? No, that's fine. We can go to questions. Thank you, Jeremy. But if you want to chip in, please indicate on the chat. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yes, Councillor Bolt and then Councillor King, I think, next. Yeah, just a quick one. Unfortunately, it might be for Ms. Shirley with regards to one of the slides she showed with um, the justification for one agricultural worker and the stock levels and everything else. I just wanted to ask a question regarding that. That, that slide is actually talking about the applicants um, stock and everything else and that justifies one agricultural worker is that correct uh, so this slide shows the level of livestock that is held um, and that is used to inform the man hour calculation which indicates that there is a need for a full-time worker in connection with the livestock and the 237 acres of grassland to be maintained um, but as i mentioned that kind of one element of us determining a functional need i appreciate that it's, i'm just trying to get my head around they've got 237 acres of land we saying that somebody else is using part of that land for other agricultural use? Uh, if I may, um, I've just asked Emma to just put up the map of the certain blue land. Yes, um, this this is the, the, the rented land at Clua. This was used was were, uh, by another application, the application at the piggeries for an agricultural worker's dwelling. It formed at that part, at that stage, it was part of the justification of that agricultural worker's dwelling. So we've accepted that someone living at the piggeries uh, near Brinston could farm this land and that they, a, a dwelling was necessary there to meet the needs of agricultural activities on this land here. If we look at the red land, it's a smaller area of land, Emma, if you could indicate, um, but part of the red land was from the agricultural holding um, that justified the dwelling at Copse Lane. So again, part of the land that the applicant now for their business case on has been used to justify a dwelling at, at another location and very nearby. Now I accept that in certain circumstances, agricultural land is sold. And I think that was the case with this red land. I also accept that grass keep varies from year to year. Yes. Um, but this is all very recent, particularly with blue land. The applicant rented that land, sublet it, I believe, to... So this is the problem. Is there an overlay with the blue and the red together? No, they are separate. Uh, it's not the same. The rented land. land. This is the rented land that flew up and see on the screen. So this 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 doesn't overlap at all. No. So, so yeah, it, the overlap is purely that two previous applications for agricultural dwellings have referred to some of the land that the applicant now bases are holding on. 
Now, yeah, so what we're saying here is why can't one of these other agricultural workers' lanes continue to meet the needs of this particular holding, given that's exactly what someone argued uh, a couple of years ago in relation to this land at Glua, and or, okay, about 12 years ago in relation to Copswood. So I think we, you know, we're just conscious of that, that issue there. Um, you know, members with experience of agriculture may sort of understand how, why land holdings change, grass keep probably changes on an annual basis. Um, short term uh, farm tenancies may change sort of every however, well, however long, five, ten years maybe. I don't know, you know it, it depends on the deal that's been done with the landowner. Um, but our question, the question in our minds here is, why could not either of the agricultural dwellings that have been approved for the agricultural needs of this land continue to meet the needs of this land? We don't feel that's been adequately explained. We know there's an ownership issue, we know it's two different people who own it, but that doesn't mean why, you know, it, it has been explained why it is unavailable. So the applicant has control over the two other agricultural houses? No. I think the, the challenge um, that I saw from it reading between the two reports is that this is one application for a standalone enterprise, for a standalone dwelling, yes. in connection with the land parcels that are highlighted red and blue, as shown to members today. As part of looking through the policy, the policy requires them to demonstrate there is a functional need for, for at least one agricultural worker, which they've done. They need to prove that they've invested in the business, which clearly is in sense of the outbuildings they've done. It then goes on to say if the functional need could be met by any other existing suitable or available dwelling within the area, um, or the need cannot be filled, fulfilled by another existing building capable of conversion. And the crossover is there's dual ownership of some of the land parcels which have previously been used for a different agricultural enterprise to justify two separate agricultural worker dwellings, which the applicant has confirmed they have no control over, but they've both been implemented, they're both under construction, so they are both live consents that are relevant for this application because they are alternative agricultural dwellings. And because of the overlap of land, what you almost need to justify one unit on this enterprise because of the overlap is to understand how both enterprises work to demonstrate there is still a need for the two that have been consented on the adjoining enterprise and there is the need for an additional unit on this enterprise given the overlap but i think that's the gap we've got with this application because this is just for this enterprise but the confusion is the overlap of land and the fact that that's been used to justify other dwellings. So has that question been asked of the applicant? Yes. yes. I, I, I would say her, her, her response is you know, that, that, that whilst you know, she accepts that she has a relationship with the owner of the, 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 the applicant in the other two applications, what she said her position very clearly is that she has no hold over those sites he owns those in, in his own right and that she operates or she is she accepts that she has a relationship with that that party she operates completely a separate agricultural enterprise that needs to be viewed in its own right so it is very complicated i must admit i've never come across one quite like this with these overlaps however we are looking at what appears to be a you know, degree of commonality between three agricultural Three application, three applications for agricultural urban dwellings in terms of personal, the persons involved, and the land involved. At no point have we seen a case that says actually we need three agricultural urban dwellings on this holding. Um, that might be an alternative way forward if they saw the yeah, we said, well, let's look at this, look at the enterprise in its entirety. The land has there's commonality between the two agricultural urban dwellings, there's commonality. At a personal level, but we accept at a business level, it is separate. But if we look at that all together, does that create a need for further agricultural work as well? Would be an alternative way of looking at this, which I think would be much more comfortable. But as it stands, we just have to, we're just aligned to the fact that three years ago, the Blue Land justified a house at the bigger uh, the And now it's claimed a second dwelling is needed at this site. 
Um, so that's that's really where we are. We don't think the alternative accommodation options have been properly explored. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, just a question regarding the application site. I noticed from the, the slides that there's already two existing buildings on the site. With an approval application for another one. So we're allowing agricultural buildings on the site, but the one I'm saying they can't have that dwelling. Is that correct? Uh, we are allowing those dwelling um, in in the absence of this application. It would be we would still be quite happy with the dwellings here, uh, the agricultural buildings here, because it forms part of a holding where an agricultural dwelling was approved at the Piggeries to meet the needs of the agricultural activities at this site. So from that point of view, we're entirely happy with it. It's a little bit more cloudy now. Thank you. Ms. Um, Jolly. Thank you, Chairman. Hold on, yes. just, if, again, Emma, if you could start the system to catch up this end. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Please yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to add to that, in terms of the permissions granted for the agricultural buildings, um, the, the livestock of the buildings currently in connection with the holding are in Clua, which I mentioned are some distance from where the applicant currently resides. So when the applications came in for these agricultural buildings, in, in effect, they brought the livestock is holding closer to their residents and onto their own land. So there, there was no kind of query at that stage. That, that, that was kind of perfectly acceptable, really. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with these other sites that keep getting mentioned, um, are they, um, when they went through, obviously they went through on a different agricultural number i presume so surely we should be looking at this as a whole different sort of set of um farm really yeah patient not looking at the other um sort of uh, houses that have been built i presume there's um other uh, agricultural buildings <coughs> with them um here i cannot see a problem with having agricultural dwelling there next to these buildings as it will create security for them there's more and more farm thefts going on and about so I can't see a problem with this at the moment. Thank you. Do you want to address the again the issue about the agriculture holding and what good if, if I can just clarify for my own understanding, what we're saying is is that if this land that is being put forward with this application had not been cited on other applications, we would be looking at this saying this is adequate. Yeah. The concern the authority is having is to say, well, this land in effect has already been used to justify one unit, so can it be used twice to justify a, a second unit? Yeah, effectively, there, there are two separate enterprises running, but crossover of ownership of the land. So the land has been used by both separate enterprises to justify agricultural workers' buildings, two of which are implemented, so they are live, they are consented. There are two consented new dwellings in the countryside justified on the agricultural information provided. The question, because of the change in approach for this enterprise now presenting the same land to justify another unit, is do the two existing units that have been justified by the same land, are, you know, could they be used or is there a need for them or not? Because if, if you were looking at two separate enterprises, but overall combined, they have a need for three dwellings, that would be acceptable. The question is, if you're exchanging land parcels between the two, is there still a need for the two that consented? If there isn't, there is a process where someone can quash a consent they've got, so they would lose one of the agricultural worker dwellings off of the two that have been consented, if there's no longer a need for two, which would then free up that level of need for the unit, the site that we're currently looking at. The difficulty is we're being asked to look at this bit in isolation as a separate enterprise, and it is a separate ent enterprise, but because of the shared land, because of the consented agricultural worker consents in the area, 
that as, as officers we're just saying there's not enough information at the moment submitted with this one application to justify that as a separate land holding as a separate enterprise with the shared combined land given the extent consent of the two agricultural workers dwellings which also share the justification of the same land that there's not enough evidence for us to be justified that you could consent another dwelling in the countryside based on the crossovers but that's that's where the recommendation has come from they they have submitted enough information to say they own enough land and they um, have enough animals and to keep the animals and to keep the land they have demonstrated they need a agricultural workers dwelling but it, the the, dis, the, the um, lack of clarity is almost where that fits in with the other two that have also been justified and commenced thank you councillor facing yeah same chairman um looking to you chairman your experience it seems to me and looking at people's faces i'm pointing that everything is peaceful it's all i can tell what we're all a little bit confused. Would this not be the case of a deferral, Chairman, and a free go to come back with it? Go and mind what some of the officers have said. Yes. So, yeah. so just to confirm, if, as this is their first application, if this were refused, they would have a free go to come back to, to address it, or are there going to be issues with red lines? There, there would be issues, I would suspect, with red lines. If, if you submit the same application, the same proposal with the same red outline, um, you would get a free go. Um, if we are suggesting that you might need to combine both enterprises to understand the combined agricultural need of both units, given the crossover and land ownership, it's likely that the red and blue outlines would be larger to accommodate both the units. Right, thank you for your guidance on that. Make that case. Any other questions or comments from members before we move to looking for a recommendation? Just for Councillor Bolt. A bit of clarity, Alan Councillor Perry. What is in outlined in red didn't form part of the application for the other two dwellings, or did it? Uh, do you want to discuss it in or the, oh, I can just clarify on, on okay. this drawing, the application site where the dwelling he wants to go, no. no. Uh, but so it's 102 that, acres which red line do Yeah, if, if Ms. Ms. Chorley could just put up the red line plan of the land that is owned, um, which, which bit form part of the Coxwood application, if you could just indicate. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but it's a bit error here for the um, part of the application for the dwelling that we would name, which is located in the UHF. So for clarity, part of the red was used to justify one of the ones, and part of the blue was used to justify the other one. All of the blue land. All of the blue, sorry, thank you. Councillor Perry. No, I'm just going to ask the same question. So okay, no worries. Um, yes, Councillor Hendry. As hard as it may seem, obviously, to all the comments, and uh, I have to move the officer's recommendation. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Granta. Yes, well, I'd, I'd like to second that, uh, Chairman, please. I, I, I think the officers have done a good job, it's been a very difficult decision to make, but uh, I, mean, I can't say that you can justify agricultural workers dwelling uh, twice on, on one piece of land. So obviously I'd like to belong with the officer's recommendation. So I'd like to second Councillor Henry. Thank you. I've got yes, Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I just clarify the position with the two um, agricultural dwellings that have been granted permission? Have they both been Commence but not completed. Is that part of the plan correct? That is correct, yes. So if one of them was, I'm, I'm just interested in this comment from the officer that one of them could be quashed. Um, what happened? If they've been commenced, is that a problem? It, it would be a choice of the applicant for those agricultural worker dwellings, which, which the applicant for this application isn't. So it would be another party's decision yeah. if if they concluded that they no longer needed 
the additional agricultural land for dwelling because of change of ownership or change of land holdings. It may be that actually they've got more land and it's a different land holding that now relates to it, but they are all the questions that we've got in terms of justifying the additional. You can apply if it's your own consent, quash your own consent, but it is a process that a third party would have to apply for to get consent quashed if if there was a finite amount of need that justified it, the two. If that makes sense, or just confused you further. I think you may have just confused me further. <laughs> if, if, so if it was the third party part that I'm not clear about. The, the applicant who is um, applying for this application isn't the same as the applicant. Is for, not the same as the applicant for the airport. Right, it, would, it, it would require an understanding of the co owner of the land and the applicants. If, if the, the land holding and level of need hadn't increased for that site. And I think that's where also the comment was made last season. There would be the opportunity for an, a further discussion in terms of are there extra bits of land that are now being done by the almost if you look at the thing in the whole, the comment was made earlier, could there be a justification for three agricultural workers unit justified by the rest of the holding? But it would have to be looked at as the whole, whereas we're only looking at one part of it at the moment. Yes. But that would be a discussion outside of this because it would be a completely different application. It would then be an application on behalf of two separate business owners yes. or three applications where they co own the land. Yeah. Yes. I'm just going to say it would be an opportunity um, because this applicant is not entirely unrelated or unknown to the applicant of the other two ones. Um, it would be an opportunity for a better supporting case that could restate the agricultural justification for the two existing workers, agricultural workers dwellings, that might sort of then tease out how land ownerships and land access to land has changed. And if we have that opportunity, well, the Coxwood one is the business is based on this land doing this, just to restate of that. The Elmfield Piggeries one is this land based on that. And you, know, you, you can be, therefore assure yourself, Mr. Planning Officer, that those two remain viable agricultural workers' dwellings and haven't just you know, lost all their land to this one. It just allows us to see it all, the big picture of everything. Um, because at the moment, unfortunately, we are being, you know, I, I think that this happened we've been a bit hard on that, but simply because it's, it's come through so quickly after the previous ones, where, hang on a moment, your justification, your, your land holding just the private dwelling over there, and over there, and now we need one here as well, based on the same land holding. That's where this application comes on stuff. It may be quite easy to explain in a resubmission, um, and yeah, that's what I would hope would happen after any refusal. Any other questions from the members in which case we have a recommendation to review permission which has been proposed by Hamish Councillor Henry second to Councillor Carter yes yes those in favour of that recommendation to refuse please show one two three four six seven eight eight and those against please show one, two, three. And are there any abstentions? Yes. That's 12, that's correct. Eight, three and one. Yeah. So that is clearly carried. I think as, as the discussion has shown though, I would hope that there will be further discussions between the applicant and, and our planning officers to see if there is a, a, a way forward to to look at this. If we could maybe take a council break, then we'll have that. The time at the moment I'm making it 20. Right, that's all. Start to one, two. Give everyone ten minutes. Is that enough? Okay. Thank you all very much. Right, members. It's uh, twenty-five two. So we can restart again. Just a reminder: the application page fifty-eight has been withdrawn from the agenda. Um, it's been dealt with as delegated. So we move to page sixty-four, please. Um, Cheddar and Mr. Titchener. Do you want to introduce this one for us, please? Thank you, Chairman. Just want to check that you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, so the application in front of us uh, now is for the retention of a three metre by 12 metre billboard advertising uh, new homes. It's located at land to the west of Upper New Road in Cheddar. I'm just going to wait for the next slide to click over. Um, just while I'm waiting for that, um, it's essentially an, uh, a billboard that's been erected by Law Homes in association with their um, uh, allocated site that was granted permission, uh, I believe, last uh, year for 134 homes, uh, one of the allocated sites in the uh, Sedgemoor local plan. Uh, right, OK, so the slides come up, so hopefully you can all see that. Uh, so um, the allocated site uh, is all this sort of land here known as Holwell Lane. So that's already got permission. Um, the billboard is located in this direction, uh, this location here, uh, and oriented to uh, face east, so it's visible from vantage points along the road. Uh, red line plan just showing its position. Uh, nearest properties uh, here indicated that are located on Upper New Road. This is the detail, uh, so I have some photos you would see it as it's a retention application, but this is essentially what's uh, advertised on that board. Um, so uh, yes, it's not illuminated, relatively muted colours, these sort of dark navy um, uh, scheme. Uh, it's about 1.5 metres off the ground and then the three metre height starts uh, from uh, the, the bottom part to the top. Uh, these are, I've only got a couple of photographs just taken from um, a couple of, uh, one place where you could pull in off up a new road. Um, this is the billboard here, uh, partially screened by these trees. Um, uh, it's not the easiest to see from the photographs. It wasn't particularly obvious, I have to say, when I was on, on site. Uh, I did initially think that when I saw the application that it was 12 metres in width, that that sounded quite large, but in the context of where it is, uh, it didn't seem quite so when you actually get to the site. Um, another photograph just taken a uh, slightly different position, but in that same sort of wider access off of uh, up a new road. Uh, so this is just immediately beside the, the road. So the highway is behind uh, me when I was taking this photograph. You can see it here and it's partially screened but by these trees. You can see it uh, when you're there. It's not particularly obvious. Um, there are no plans to remove any of these trees. Uh, the applicant has confirmed uh, to improve its uh, visibility. Um, so um, as I stated, it's retention of the billboard is what's sought for Bloor Homes Phase 2 at Holwell Lane. Um, it's not an illuminated sign. In terms of the context of where we are, we are uh, uh, in this part of Cheddar. It's uh, about 450 metres away from where they area of outstanding natural beauty starts, um, but not, uh, uh, but you know, that designation is not too uh, far to the north. They are only seeking a temporary permission. They're only seeking advertisement consent uh, for the sign until January next year. So it's not a particularly long consent, to which point the sign would come down. It's obviously a short term uh, arrangement just to promote the houses which have been where construction has already started on site uh, just to generate some, some interest. Uh, as it's an advertising consent, it's slightly different from a planning permission. There's only real two real considerations in these types of applications. One is amenity, so in terms of its visual uh, amenity and other related factors such as architectural, cultural amenity. And the second is public safety. Generally, that's to do with highway safety, whether there are any implications in that regard. In terms of the amenity considerations, our policies talk about proposals should be of high quality design and in terms of landscape impacts, it should be where there are within the setting of an A1B that any harm to the character of that area would only be supported if it can be negated through mitigation. Now the sign is oriented to face up a new road as the photos indicate, that's where it would be observed from. Um, as I stated, it's not particularly prominent, partially screened by the trees. The separation distance to the road is about 100 metres, so that further minimises the visual impact that it has. Um, concern has been expressed by the Paris Council and the Mendip Society about the impact on the Mendip Hills AONB. Um, we did seek the advice of our landscape officer on the proposal. She noted that it was set back from the highway within the line of the hedgerow. And she noted that whilst the AOMB is in relative or is in relatively close proximity, she was of the opinion that separation distance is such to not impact on views from the AOMB. Um, she also noted the temporary nature of the permission. Views are really only likely from the highway, and even then, given its setback, these views are only likely to be glimpsed. 
It's not considered to be harmful to the character of the area or the protected landscape that's located about 400 metres to the north. Again, it's not illuminated. The colours are fairly muted, fairly dark, and it's not considered as harmful to visual amenity. In terms of public safety, that's typically uh, a consideration of whether it's harmful to highway safety. So if a sign were capable of distracting dr drivers so as to cause driver error, uh, highways referred, the Highway Authority referred this application to standing advice. Their document in terms of the impact of signage proposals state that proposed should not distract drivers through dazzle, glare, size, detailing, proximity to highway. Um, so uh, it's not an illuminated sign. It's dark, it's so it's not lit up, it's not going to cause dazzle or glare. Um, at best, realistically, drivers are only going to get glimpses through the trees, and even then they would have had to you know, be looking pretty much over their shoulder uh, to do so. Um, I, I almost drove past it when I was actually looking for it, I have to say. So I, um, I don't think that it's going to be particularly uh, distracting uh, at all. Um, the separation distance, furthermore, it's such that it's really unlikely to in interfere with the use of the highway. Uh, so we do, in that regard, we don't consider it to be harmful to public safety. And therefore, um, it's we do not consider it prejudicial to amenity or public safety. We would impose that condition. It's removed at the end of the temporary period, so that's January 2022. But the recommendation is that uh, advertisement consent is granted. Thank you. Any comments or questions, please, we've got Councillor Facey, <laughs> Councillor Henry, <laughs> Councillor Pierce, <laughs> Councillor Granter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Chairman, we all like to move the right hand. Councillor Henry. I don't understand why this has got this far. Can you speak up, please? Yeah, I, I don't know why this has got this far. Why, why was it granted by the delegation? Why has that got this far? But it, it's here because the parish council have objected to it. I'm fine. I, I just, I, anyway, I'm quite happy to say it in terms it's, of Well, I think their reasoning is it's the impact on the mendips and the visual impact. Yeah, okay. So, okay. but uh, okay, so that's seconded, I think you said. Then it was Councillor, was it Councillor Scott? Did you indicate? <coughs> yeah, I'd like, I agree. I think it's a total waste of time. <laughs> and I think that um, the parish council should be pulled over the cons for it because you can't see it. The tree does obliterate it, and I'm pleased to. No, the, the tree isn't going to be chopped down by the developer. Thank you. Councillor Pierce? I was picked at the post. Councillor Granton? I'm coming the four of Councillor Ribbons? I'm particularly enjoying the paradox of having an advert that can't be seen, <laughs> um, which seems to be particularly pointless in, in, in any exercise whatsoever. Uh, I, I'm, I'm tempted to ask for a planting scheme to obscure it from public view. <laughs> Was there any so further comments on the right hand side before we move to a vote? <laughs> yes, Councillor Kingham. Well, I've quiet, I have seen it. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've got a fairly good idea of where this might be going. Um, those in favour of the recommendation to, uh, to grant the show. I think that's unanimous. Let's, uh, thank you very much. Mrs. Nichols is that vote. It's not worth it. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Um, so we move on then to our last application, which is in Mark, and I think it's Mr. Evans. You're presenting this one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I don't know if you can hear me. We um, can. We need you to tell you. Okay. Um, so if I. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure you've all cut out. Okay, there we go. Um, so this application is for uh, the change of use of some agricultural land uh, just to the north of Northwick Road in Mark, sorry, the south of Northwick Road in Mark, and for the erection of a three bay garage uh, as part of that proposal. So there are two elements to this scheme. Uh, so the application site is located here, is accessed off of Northwick Road here with Back Lane serving as its principal access. Back Lane itself is also lined by an existing bridle way and a public right of way also traverses the site towards the south towards Mark Causeway um, and these issues have, have come up in the course of this application. 
This is the application site as existing. So we have the principal dwelling here with various a garage here and another outbuilding here. Uh, the right of way is indicated by the blue line with the bridal way and the right of way down here. The application is seeking to extend the garden curtilage of the property via this red area here. Uh, Liam, can you just bear with us a minute? I've got a question coming from a member. Yeah, I just, um, when um, it's actually saying where it is, there's no arrow indicating. Is that, is that coming up on the Oh, right. I, had, I must have, I had it online. I have so. yeah. oh, It's back now. I'm just circling the red line area. So um, if I try and rely less on the arrow and more on describing it, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, so the red line area is the area in which the uh, applicants are seeking to extend the uh, residential curtilage of the property. Um, so this is on the, 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 the left hand side picture as you see it here. Um, so this is the existing situation. Uh, the next slide um, indicates the proposed layout of the uh, extended curtilage, uh, which will be used for parking, turning and private amenity space. The application site, as I said before, is, is separated or traversed through the centre via uh, by a bridal way and a, a public right of way as well. Um, the public right of way is travelling past the west elevation of the existing property uh, and joins up with the bridal way, which goes from Northwick Road all the way on to Southwick Road, I believe, uh, to the west. Uh, this application is proposing to divert the route immediately around the property uh, and create uh, more of a private enclosure for the residential property, which is in effect separated from its own garden by the, res uh, by the uh, footpath. Uh, as part of the application, it's also proposed to erect a three bay garage, uh, which you can see uh, on, the, on the drawings here. Uh, there will be two garages and one carport on the ground floor with ancillary storage uh, above, which will be uh, accommodated within the roof. Um, and as you can see, it has roof lights and windows to the gable elevations as well. Uh, this will be used in ancillary capacity with the cottage um, and also used for parking uh, as a result of the extended parking and turning area to the front. If we move on to the photographs now, this is a view of the site from Norfolk Road to the north. Um, this is a view along the existing driveway, where as you can see the signs for the public right of way are visible and the footpath basically goes along this driveway here. And along the front of the property there. These photographs indicate the location of the proposed garage area, uh, sorry, garage building. Um, uh, this view on the bottom left hand of the cor left hand corner of the screen shows the view from Norfolk Road and the garage will be situated uh, against the backdrop of these trees here. This second photograph in the top right hand corner indicates a bit more of a close up view of the proposed site in the extended garden curtilage area. Um, this will be where the garage will be situated and the public right of way will go around the north area of this and meet up with the bridal way as it goes out towards the west. We move on to the second slide. So this is the application property, the cottage here. Uh, this is the garage that was indicated on the plan. And this is another outbuilding which is of no considerable architectural merit or condition. Um, these will be removed as shown on the planning application uh, plan and replaced with the garage and the storage area. So the use of these buildings will cease, be removed and is considered as a result. The, the setting of the right of way will be enhanced as the right of way itself goes along this, this track here. Uh, it's fairly enclosed by these buildings um, and the removal will open this out uh, and allow um, a bit more of a a building of more uh, visually pleasing appearance, I would say. Uh, this is a shot, uh, the top right hand corner photograph shows the uh, footpath of the bridal way as it goes around the property towards Northwick Road. So this is the west elevation of the cottage. Um, and this just indicates the fact that the footpath itself does go through the center of the site between the property and its uh, residential area, uh, sorry, and, and the sort of amenity space that they're currently using informally at the moment. 
The bottom left hand photograph indicates the garage and the again a view from the more northern end of the footpath uh, towards uh, the bridleway. Um, this final uh, slide is a view uh, looking towards the west and as you can see this is the bridleway in terms of its character fully enclosed by the existing tree planting on the either side. It opens out as you get further west and uh, sorry this is Harp Road the access from the, the initial access onto the bridal ways from Harp Road from the west uh, and this indicates that access to the fields either side of the bridal way will not be impinged by the development. Uh, in fact it should hopefully enhance the access to uh, the fields uh, beyond this site. Um, we have had an objection from the Parish Council based on the diversion of the right of way. Um, this is uh, this is as a result of uh, plans that were initially submitted. Uh, we did receive amendments during the course of the application to widen the diverted footpath and bridle way, which would allow access for small vehicles if uh, those owners had right of access to use vehicles over that uh, bridle way. Uh, the, uh, the public right of way team at uh, Somerset County Council uh, have raised no objection to these amendments. They considered that the amendments would allow uh, access and meet the minimum standards in terms of width uh, that they would seek to um, preserve and allow access around the property. So in effect, this will create a more enclosed curtilage for the, the property while also allowing access to and from the bridal way without necessarily diverting the route uh, any great distance from its current position through the center of the site. Overall, it's considered that the development itself is uh, suitable scale and character. Um, the diversion itself of the right of way would be subject to a diversion order, which would be outside the planning application process. And uh, this will be handled by the local authority in a separate capacity. Um, however, we have no objections to the proposal in principle or based on its design layout and scale. And it's considered that the proposal will enhance the setting of the right of way uh, once the diversion order has been granted. So the recommendation is to grant consent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yeah, well, Councillor Remins, Simon, yeah. and Councillor Bolt. Thank you. Just to confirm, I look at the second point the Parish Council have raised about access to the fields through uh, 2310 with the tractor and trailer. I was satisfied that those that that field is accessible from machinery. Liam, did you hear that? I did, yes. Uh, so the, the application itself would allow access to the um, from Northwick Road via the amendments that have been created by the applicants in respect of widening the right of way um, along the bridal way. Um, in, in my report, I do mention the fact that the, the, the access from Harp Road is still available, will be unaffected by this development, and the majority of the accesses to the fields are to the west of the site. So um, th there is readily available access to those fields. It's not considered that this diversion would place any great uh, inconvenience to the landowners around the area um, because the access from the west is still available, while also this diversion will take into account the width that is required. The width proposed as an amendment is consistent with the width of the bridal way beyond the site, so it's considered there will be a uh, readily made access across the land uh, as is existing at the moment. Thank you, Liam. Any comments or questions, Councillor Evans? Oh, okay. Councillor Bolt. I like the idea of the development. Just to clarify on one of the recommendations, uh, number three, should that read the storage within the garage rather than the accommodation within the garage, or are they looking to have it as accommodation above to be used with the house? Liam? Yes, uh, so the plans are submitted. The plans I submitted do indicate storage that slash ancillary accommodation. Um, what we were keen to ensure was that we were not seeing the creation of additional planning units. I think it would be unlikely based on the fact that no plumbing is indicated, although um, and the floor space itself is pretty restrictive. So in terms of ancillary accommodation, you're probably looking at um, uh, 
uh, well, the sort of common, I guess, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head of something that um, someone would use the upper floor of a, a, an ancillary outbuilding, um, but we have had a variety of different uses down the years where these buildings have been proposed. Um, but uh, it does indicate storage, but the ancillary accommodation aspect, we did feel it was a belt and braces uh, condition that would be reasonable to ensure that the um, the use of it would be uh, ancillary to the main function of the cottage rather than its own in, uh, separate unit. Thank you. Thank you. OK, any other questions that members have got or comments or um, proposition, please? Yes, Councillor Pierce. I'm happy to propose the officer's recommendation to grant the motion. Thank you, Councillor Branton. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not seeing anyone else indicating. So we have the recommendation to grant permission moved and seconded. All those in support, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. And any against, please show. And any abstentions? Thank you. That's clearly carried. So permission is is granted. Remember that brings us to the end of all the applications today. Thank you all very much for your attendance, and we'll close the meeting. Thank you.